All right, well, it's 7.30, uh, time to get started. We've got a, a few things on the agenda tonight before the main course of the meeting, nothing that will take very long. Um, so it's uh, we, we like to knock it off early so that everybody gets to hear it before we start everything else. Um, so the first thing on the list here, yeah, not necessarily following John's schedule, uh, John, why don't you give us a rundown, quick rundown on HamFest this past uh, past weekend? All right. Uh, by all accounts, uh, it was a success. Uh, folks were uh, very positive about it. Um, since we've been dealing with the off and on over the last four or five years with COVID and other stuff, Um we basically broke even, which was kind of honestly a goal for us this year. Yep. Um, we lost money in uh, 22. And uh, so we were we were at least <clears throat> working to at least make sure that we broke even, uh, which we pretty much did. So we're, we're good there. And like I said, we had a lot of uh, positive comments, even with some vendors that were missing uh, due to illnesses and such, which we've dealt with the last couple of years. And it, it hit again this year. Um, but it bodes well for the future. Uh, the guy from chat radio, Jim, uh, KM for, uh, MPH, I think it's called this, um, was pleasantly, pleasantly surprised. Uh, he didn't know what to expect. It was his first year and, uh, he was really happy, did really well and was looking forward to next year. Um, we had quite a few volunteers would have been nice to have had a few more volunteers, but, um, we, we may do with what we had, uh, had a few holes here and there that, that could have been, would have been nice to have had filled, but uh, we dealt with it and made it work. So um, if, um, if you ever thought about volunteering to help out, at least if nothing else on the day of the ham fest, please think about that for next year because it makes, and, and when, this, when the volunteer sheets start running around, sign up early and often so that we have a chance to make sure we've got everything covered. But uh like I said, um, a lot of positive comments. I didn't really hear any negative comments, um, other than the fact, like I said, there were wireman was out and Simon wasn't there either. They'll be back with us next year. And uh, we'll have a few others that uh, we haven't seen in a while. And, and Satellite Sam was another one. Uh, he also had uh, medical issues, basically, and couldn't make it at the last minute. So, um, all we need now, pretty much right now, is uh, if you happen to go to it, um, you know, shoot us an email with your thoughts, uh, any things you like, things you didn't like, things you might like to see for next year, and uh, go ahead and get those to us while it's fresh on your mind. You can send that to uh, any of the board members, and our, our emails are our position at atlantaradioclub.org. Um, you can also send it to XCOM. Uh, e x c o m m at atlantaradioclub.org, and you can also send it to uh, Hamfest Chair at atlantaradioclub.org. Any one of those, or if you catch us at a meeting coming up, or lunch or something. But uh, while it's fresh on your mind, shoot us an email and let 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 us know what you thought and what you'd like to something you might like to see added or changed or didn't like or whatever. Whether it was something in the forms, uh, something in the main hall, out in the uh, the uh, tailgating area and so on and so forth. So, um, like I said, uh, as far as I can tell, um, I think we can stamp this as, as a success. So, yeah, when, when break even is your goal, uh, we we were just we were just trying to decide if if the ham fest was even feasible. I got there at nine o'clock because I had an antenna session coming up at, at between 10 and noon. So I, I didn't, I hauled all my stuff in Friday and then came here about nine o'clock because I wanted to go down through the boneyard. And I was surprised at how many people were not only in the boneyard, but how many people were just walking through the boneyard. Uh, I think I saw probably 300 or more just along that one little stretch. It was really surprising. And I ran into several people that I had not seen probably in 10 years that were there. So we, we did a pretty good job of getting the word out. And I think the fact that the hand fence has been hit or miss because of COVID and the park construction and other things, um, you, you know, you, you, you miss a year and you lose some of the consistency and you kind of get out of people's minds. I, I think I think we're back in. So it is your club. If you have any comments or suggestions, we need to we need to hear them. That's about all there is. 
Hey, anything else, John? No, and and like I said, I'm not afraid to hear negative comments too. Uh, I've got thick skin, and you know, I can't fix what's what what I don't know is broken or what you don't like. So uh, let it all hang out and let us know. But uh, that's about all I have for that right now. It was cloudy that morning. You you need to think about that next year. It was a little bit cloudy when I got over there. I'll work on the weather for next year. Uh, all right. Uh, again, you know. Count? Did we, Go did ahead. we get a head count for how many folks were, you know, showed up with uh, bought tickets? Uh, no, we don't have an official head count yet to, to let out, but we'll, we'll know shortly. Anything else? Good question. I didn't even think to ask that. I was just worried about the final, the bottom line. Did, did we make, did we break even? That was the goal. Um, clubs all over are hurting. Ham fists all over are, are, losing their locations. Knoxville Ham Fist had to move from uh, places they'd been for 35 years and they got bumped out last year and they had to struggle. They didn't know until later, I mean, later in February, if they were even going to have a location, though they suspected. Uh, so yeah, any comments, suggestions, good or bad, uh, let's hear them. Um, second thing I have on my agenda here is um, Field day is coming up. That's always a big thing for our club. Has been for the last 15, 20 years. And John has it on the on the update there. Uh, I've talked to two people. And I was thinking we'd find a place to be overnight in case people want to stay overnight. I approached the uh, Rangers at Abbott's Bridge, which is part of the Chattahoochee National uh, Resource, <clears throat> whatever that is, <clears throat> recreational area. And his 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 thing to me was that different rangers in different areas of the park, which is scattered out all along the river, uh, have some leeway on what they consider to be camping. Camping is not allowed. Uh, some of them, like the one over Marietta, says you can't even be there, period, for any reason. Uh, one of the other areas says basically, yeah, you can be there as long as you don't have tents and a campfire going. And uh, this guy at Abbey's Bridge, which is the easiest one for us to get to, said, uh, you know, I don't want you out of the car. Uh, he understands that young couples come by and park back in there, and, and he just doesn't want us anybody there at all. So um, we may find another location for next year. But this year it will be at Brook Run Park uh, at the bottom of the hill next to the main intersection, next to the restrooms across from the amphitheater. Uh, we've been there a couple times the last few years, did uh, George Cuso party there. It's a good location, a lot of foot traffic near the restrooms. Um, and we'll start setting up about noon. The official start of field day is usually 2 p.m. So we'll start setting up about noon and uh, come on by and, and get on the air. We're going to we're going to have some limits this year on on the number of radios. Uh, normally, I would say if you've got a radio, bring it. If you've got an antenna, bring it. Uh, to some degree, that's true, but you may be the only person working on a band, and we will be limited to the big bands, uh, 20, 40, 10, 6, and 15, I think, are the bands that we're thinking about covering this year. Um, we got one guy, I see him on here, Lynn, he loves doing six meter, so he'd have a six meter something up, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking this year I'll bring my crazy 10 meter CB antenna, if y'all ever seen it, it um, uses unmodified CB whips, but it's perfect in 10 on 10 meters. And 10 has been open off and on. So I'm, I may take up the 10 meter spot. Everything else, come on out and just have fun. We'll have soft drinks. Uh, we'll have water. We'll have chips and snacks and things. Started Official start is at 2 p.m. The official end is when the last person drives out of the parking lot. Um, and typically that's about 8 p.m. or so. People want to get kind of tired about dark and it's time to go home. So there's field day. Uh, keep an eye on the website and whatnot for more updates. Um, 13 colonies. This is going out just a little bit further. Uh, we we have permission to be K4G for the 13 colonies in the first week in July. Actually, we're talking Saturday the 6th. Uh, so if y'all don't know what 13 colonies is, be sure and Google it. It's a fun event that occurs first week in July. Uh, Nathan Wood is the Georgia State Coordinator. He's, he's a really cool guy. He and I have talked a couple times about uh, us having a setup for that day. So it's the it, plans in the works, let's put it that way. But we're thinking right now it will be Saturday the 6th. Uh, and again, it will be operating probably from the morning, morning time because it's a 24-hour thing. 
So we'll probably crank it up and come on the air about 9 a.m. or so and run until, again, dark, uh, 7.30, 8 o'clock or so. And uh, we will have more information from Nathan as time goes on. Second Sunday session is coming up day after, day after, day after, day after tomorrow, like Sunday the 9th. Um, and I've posted it a couple of times on the on Yahoo groups, uh, groups.io now. Um, coax and connectors. It's the, the famous thing that we did a few years back. Everybody seems to love it. You bring coax in, we'll put 259s on, 239s. Not only put them on, but learn how to do them. Uh, I use a blowtorch. Some people use a soldering gun. Blowtorch is more fun. Uh, we'll also have power poles, putting on crimps, connectors, stripping wire, uh, soldering if that's what if that's what needed. Anything that you can do with wire, we'll figure out how to do it. And uh, it's it's usually pretty good for experimenting. So bring wire, bring connectors, bring whatever tools you got. Uh, the the posting is out there on groups IO. It's in the uh, Angel Flight Room at the Epps Building at the cab at each three airport which is pdk and testing starts at noon testing is usually over in that room by 2 p.m is that right ron uh rob yes yes too so we we will pick up as soon as the testing is done we don't want to disturb anybody taking a test so we'll say the starting time the nominal time is 2 p.m but there may be some some wiggle room in that um and we've also today we're looking at the future that's june the second Sunday in July, of course, will be 13 colonies. Uh, and then we're looking into August, and we're thinking that the second Sunday in August event might be an antenna build. Uh, I've had several people who saw what we were doing at the ham fest. They didn't come to the table at the ham fest. But I've had several people ask if we could do an antenna build. So August may be a good time to do that. Uh, more information on that later. Uh, anything else we've got to mention? Does anybody have anything they want to throw in real quick? Uh, do we want to mention the in-person meetings? Well, go ahead, John. Mention that. Uh, keep an eye on the email, but it looks like we're going to get back to uh, in-person meetings at the with the August meeting. So uh, we're looking at uh, I'm working on lining up the. Uh, Episcopal Church right across from Brook Run there on North Peachtree. Um, so keep an eye out for that. That looks like that's going to happen starting with August through the end of the year at least. And we'll see how much further if we end up staying there or going elsewhere. But uh, this was an attempt to get us back to in-person. So August will be a in-person and Zoom combination. So um, keep an eye out for the emails and do come if you can do the in-person because that's half the fun of being part of a club is being able to interact with your fellow hams and uh, sharing and telling. And uh, we'll, we'll try to set up a, a pre-dinner uh, spot also that's nearby. So, and we used to do that about 5.30 or so and then head over for the meeting. So that'll be, uh, the church is St. Patrick's Episcopal Church and it's right there on North Peachtree, which is just north of 285 and just uh, west of the 85, 285, about two exits. So um, right there in Dunwoody, right near the park that we normally play at. So it will be nice to uh, get back to that in person and, and get to see each other a little more often. So yeah, so. It's, uh, it's been hard finding a place within the constraints of what we have. It's something that's easy to get to, convenient to 85 and 285. And I've been looking around Brookhaven. Uh, trying to find a restaurant. John's got this church, which is right across from Brooklyn Park. Uh, if it really works out, we might want to, at the end of the year, consider changing the club name to Bark, the Brooklyn <laughs> Amateur Radio Club, since we're doing so much around there. Uh, but I'm, I'm looking forward to in-person meetings. It's, it's nice to see people eyeball to eyeball once in a while. Uh, thanks, John. I, I had I had it on my list here. I figured it would come up toward the end. Uh, don't forget to, else? don't forget to join us for lunch tomorrow. Oh yeah, Friday lunch uh, at, at, at Los Bravos. The food is actually really good, and the service is actually fast. And we'll 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 won't say good. We'll just say it's fast because a lot of times <laughs> people get the wrong meal, and uh, you know, and, and I don't. <laughs> You can have it good, you can have it fast, but you can't have it both. So it's it's quick. So I'll, I'll say that I've I've got a real kick out of lunches. 
Uh, okay, I've got one more thing, and then we'll move on and let Rob present the presenter. Uh, June is the official start, is the official kickoff of the club election season. Uh, in June, we make the announcement, which I'm making right now. Uh, by July, we present the slates, the, the ones that have organized themselves, and then August is the election itself. Uh, so if you if you would like to run for office, if you'd like to be on the board or something, it's time to let us know, um, and you can put together a slate. I would like to see some competition. Every time I've ever run, I've always said I would like to see some competition, uh, and, and never have had, so. Uh, in any event, it's coming up, so it's time to start thinking about it if you're interested in doing some sort of club activity. If you'd like to volunteer to spearhead some activity for the club, this is a good time while we're thinking about uh, club behaviors and club politics. This might be a good time to uh, volunteer for some project you would like to see, and the uh, club will throw resources behind you as we can to get it going. We can't do everything, but we can help. Uh, so there you go. The, the election season has officially started. All right, and uh, Rob, why don't you take it away? Thanks. Yeah, I got something to to add um, to that. I don't, did you mention the uh, the governor's thing for field day? No. I, did, I saw something that, uh, no, I hadn't mentioned that. Um, you know, field day is as you mentioned, you know, field day is coming up and, and clubs get points for doing all kinds of things, having um legislators there, having um different types of VIPs there, you know, whoever they can get, they get points. And some of the suburban clubs seem to wrangle those people up. What uh um uh, oops, how do I do that? What uh one of the clubs did was they got the governor, um, governor of Georgia, Kemp. And he signed a uh, proclamation declaring that week before, leading up to, and I think up to that Sunday, a field day, Amateur Radio Week in Georgia. So it's an official Georgia statewide for whatever. <laughs> it's not a holiday. It's not, no one gets it off. But it's, it's, it's um, for what it's worth, yeah, it's, it's Amateur Radio Week in Georgia. Didn't, so, didn't we have a plaque at one point, a proclamation that was signed when? Uh, we did. And there's, know, a, there's a picture of that floating around. We did. Yeah, I, um, about that. I saw one pop up in QCWA uh, where one of our local guys got that proclamation from the governor for being a survivor from 9-11. That popped up on oh, Facebook wow. this week. So that's what I was thinking when you when you said that. Yeah, there's one with Bert and uh, Jim Reed and John Davis getting the, getting the award from the governor. Yeah, and they're yeah. wearing suits. They're wearing suits, guys. I'm not going to wear a suit for amateur <laughs> radio. All right, Rob, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. And you'll do a lot of things for amateur radio, but that's where you draw the line. Yeah, I, I won't do that. So our, uh, our June program, we've got a uh, another excellent speaker, um, Warren Merkel, KD4Z. And he's going to be talking to us about a different method of programming or a different paradigm, I guess, for for programming your uh, your computers. I'm, I'm a coder from way back when. You know, Bill's a coder. we got a bunch of coders who love coding, I guess, the way it is. And we're good, you know, and we it works for us. But there are a lot of people who it doesn't work for, and people were trying to, there have been organizations trying to come up with ways of bringing computing to the people. And one of these things was IBM uh, came up with this thing that that, that node read that Warren's going to present. Um, there's another thing that came out several years ago called Scratch, which is a program that kids could use, and they write their own video games by taking boxes on a screen and just putting them together sort of like like this. But anyway... I'm looking forward to this. Hopefully, people will, will get something out of it. Uh, he's using it to control the, the ham shacks. That's what makes it um, of a special interest to us. He's figured out how to make it, make it easier, and I can't wait to hear that. So, uh, Warren, let me, t let me turn it over to you. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you very much. How's my audio? You're good. Good? Okay. Um, professional. I'm, well, <laughs> I try. I slept in a Holiday Inn Express last night, so... We'll see how this presentation goes. <laughs> Lucky for us. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, very good. Uh, I'm going to try to share my screen, but it looks like I didn't test this in advance. I need to share a panel, not just an app. Interesting. Well, this is uh, good. Um, have you guys ever shared out uh, your computers when you have multiple panels and get Get to pick which panel. Um, 
I think it actually gives you the option when you say share, it tells you which one. Okay. Uh, it's it's only offering me the app. Let's see what happens here. You so, see. There you go. Which, what screen are you seeing? Are you seeing a full screen? Or are you seeing the actual? Current, uh, current slide, one of 38 and next slide. Yeah, that's the wrong one. Hmm. That's my screen. Um, this is, I uh, don't share that often. Um, I guess I can move screens around. That's how this, it's not presenting to the correct screen. Let's try, it's not showing it. See, it's not showing. Uh, Ain't Zoom great. Yeah. PowerPoint is a virtual background, basic. I mean, if try, I sh to, try to control tab through your various windows and see which one opens. Uh, you mean alt tab? Uh, Alt, alt tab. Well, I, I have it open. I have the presentation running. It's just not giving me the opportunity to pick that screen. And when I run it, it gives you the screen. I mean, I don't want to show it half size like it's going to do here. <laughs> uh, this is love. What, what if you select that screen and then go to share? Let's try that. Um, of course, maybe if I move Zoom over to that screen and then share now, I have three panels to choose from, and that's why I thought this would be easy. We've got caught up in things like this, little little Zoom <laughs> minutia. Okay, no, same, 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 same. Where yeah. you, we get to see both your. The presentation screen uh, and your screen. Yeah, it's popping up a uh, saying it's not going to be shared until it's moved to this screen. And unfortunately, the app is doesn't give me a choice of uh, not putting that preview on that screen. <laughs> Let me take a quick breeze through here. Let me try windowed. That's screen one. One more time. PowerPoint. It's actually LibreOffice. Oh, okay. Is that the, the you know what node red uh, script to work on next? Drag to desktop one to share. So that might actually be working. Um, the intent is to see. Okay, so are you still seeing? Um, what are you seeing right now? The PowerPoint. You are? Okay. Well, let's just run with this. Um, as long as it'll let me. Yep. Okay. It's gonna, it's got a nasty little drag message in front of the screen, but mm -hmm. I know what it shows. Uh, so, okay. Thanks for uh, bearing with all that. Um, uh, my name is Warren. You can call me that. And um, I'm uh, with the North Fulton Club. So that's how you can find me. Um, I found it interesting listening to your field day discussions because we're in the middle of doing the same thing. Um, getting ready for our big soiree in Roswell. Um, so today, tonight, let's talk a little bit about Node Red. Um, I've done. Uh, I gave this presentation to North Fulton about two years ago. Uh, it's basically the same slide deck, uh, and but I've been enhanced it with some new uh, slides and information. So let's take a look at this. So uh, I can no longer see everybody's. Uh, Hands, I guess we don't really have hands right now, but uh, who hasn't heard of Node Red by now? I guess uh, would where how we'll start. It's been making the rounds for about five years, but in the past three, it's gotten a lot of traction uh, in the ham radio community. So what we're talking about uh, is basically um, a visual language for programming that. Uh, it's a lot easier than even the old days of Visual Basic, if you started playing with that. Uh, in this case, uh, you get to use other people's code, and that code is wrapped up in something they call a node. And uh, that the, the interface makes it easy for you to drag code uh, onto a workspace, and you basically connect the dots uh, doing 
little pieces of work at a time, depending on what you needed to do. So um, as Rob was saying, Node-RED was originally created as a, as a test project by IBM. And as they uh, got through the task, they realized it's a lot bigger deal than what their original ideas were for it. And they uh, also decided to release it in an open source uh, arena so everyone can use it. And um, so now we get to have it and we don't have to pay for it. Um, the idea was they call it a low code programming paradigm, which means it's not totally without script or code, but you can almost do uh, a lot of things uh, without ever writing a line of code, uh, as long as someone has provided uh, some mechanism for you to do what you might want to do. And we'll see what that may come up uh, to in a minute, uh, as far as ham radio is concerned. So since it's in the open source community, uh, it's been improved and improved over the past few years uh, by other do developers, especially hams. Uh, one in particular has taken it on to write nodes that work directly with Flex Radio and make the interfacing to Flex Radios very easy. And you'll see some screens here, and I'll show you mine at the end, uh, what you can do to basically wrap up all the complexities uh, of of maybe uh, your radio, an amplifier, your antenna switching, um, any any of the all the things that you have to have separate little programs for, and you uh, if you've got them all automated on a, on a computer, you end up resizing Windows just to make it all fit. Sometimes that just doesn't fit. So what Node Red does is uh, is as long as those applications can be controllable uh, via networking or server ports or or even general purpose IO pins, a node red can, can probably talk to it. Um, the other thing about it is uh, you can install it on a Windows machine as a server, uh, on a Linux machine, uh, all the different varieties, uh, and even the lowly Raspberry Pi, which is my personal favorite uh, because it runs great on a Raspberry Pi, especially a three or four. Uh, the thing about Node Red is, is you really aren't having to be in front or logged into the Pi or the machine you've got it installed on. You actually work with it through a web browser, so it's it's a light install. You, once you've got installed uh, on, say, a Raspberry Pi, you browse to it from another machine, say, a workstation uh, or laptop, um, and that's the neat thing about it. So you you can cross platforms with it. Um, so. Uh, they call the programs flows in Node-RED, so we'll stick with that. Um, you'll see in a minute why, because what happens is, is uh, as the data you might be manipulating or an event that you trap with a push button, something like that occurs, a message is generated and it's passed to the next node in line. And you get to pick how that flow works. And you also get to pick uh, or manipulate the data that is going between the nodes. So you might want to filter things or it, uh, enhance it or gather things up and then send it. That's all very possible. So the neat thing about these nodes are they're black boxes. And uh, once they've been debugged and proven to work, uh, you can just drag them off a little area called the palette and put them in your workspace and then, and you don't have to worry about what's inside as long as you understand what inputs it needs and what outputs it generates. Uh, it becomes part of your application. Um, the uh, idea is, is, is it's a message-driven paradigm. So when something happens, like you click a button, for instance, that you can put on what we'll call a dashboard from Node-RED, that generates an event. It may have some message in it that says I was the about box in your application and it would pass a, a string that says about in it and then in the next box you might say well uh, if he clicks that button do this open up this window or send a message out to another area of the application to do something uh, it could be you know antenna one antenna two antenna three and then when you get the message in the next node you might want to test which number it is and then send the command to your antenna switch to actuate that appropriate message. So messages are what it's all about. But what is in a message? Well, the message is really just 
a JavaScript, a JavaScript object. And we'll look at that in a minute uh, more clearly. So here's a couple uh, samples of nodes uh, that are available from the, the base stock uh, installation of Node Red. The one on the left uh, is a clock generator. It just generates pulses. That might be useful for doing things. I uh, use it for for uh, polling for data and flashing. Warren, can you, can you yes, pull sir. up that slide? Oh, can you pull up that slide? The, it's still on the right in the in the next code in the next slide window. You're oh, I thought you were actually still viewing the. Um, you're you're not you're you're in the preview. You're not viewing the the full pr presentation mode. No, we're in the two. The, yeah, the two screens. Well, I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, um, I don't even see that screen right now, so I am not. Well, just flip to the next screen and see <laughs> see if that's what it is. Well, I'm talking I'm talking about the one on the left right now. So it, ignore what's uh, coming up next. It went away. Whatever oh, screen we had, it went away. Now, do you see anything? <laughs> Can you, A vertical you line. Any presentation? How about now? No. Now we have it full screen. It, all right. Okay. Now I'm not going to touch a thing. <laughs> uh, it, it went to not full screen, but it was for a split second. It was full screen. Uh, all is I did it, was maximize it. Is, it. is, it. is so that full screen, screen now? That's full screen. That's bigger. Yeah. That's better. Okay. This... I'm just wondering if it's supposed to be smoking like that. <laughs> yes. Well, the interesting thing is, is now I don't have my navigation. So let's see here. <laughs> Uh, I can I'm going to only be able to go forward here. It looks like because it's ignoring my, it's not, now ignoring my keystrokes. So I can only click forward with a mouse. So let's just talk about what's on the screen right now. So, so here, here are three nodes that, um, one of which on the left is, is a stock node and, and then palette. It's a for content, uh, working with serial interfaces, a serial port. And then in this case, you might have a, a serial GPS connected to it. And you might be looking for, you know, one of the, or more of the sentences that you can get out of a GPS for tracking the latitude and longitude, or maybe just the time. So in the middle node, there is a, a ability to filter on certain text that you could match. You could that's built in, or you can uh, search for uh, things that uh, repeat. You can filter out things you don't want. That's what you can do with the middle filtering node. Uh, it's also used to, to filter for changes. So it not necessarily from the GPS data, but you can use it to, to eliminate duplication. So if something repeats, but you don't want it to pass any information until it's changed to another state, a filter is a good way to do that. Mm -hmm. And this little sample here, all I would be doing would be filtering for some sort of data and the little node on the right actually writes a hard file on the file system of whatever um, your Node-RED server is installed on. In this case, it'd be writing to the SD card on a Pi. Uh, oh, I do. Okay, so I can do that. So here we go. So what is being passed? Uh, I've been calling them messages, uh, but they're actually JavaScript objects. If you've had any JavaScript, you, you may have already uh, been... Uh, using JavaScript objects before, but I'll just call them a container uh, that holds various other things. And in this case, uh, I have a sample showing the JavaScript object that would be appropriate to hold information about an HF radio's current state. So the, the properties are uh, up to you to add, and you can create as many as you need to, to organize what you're, you're passing around. In this case, I've got frequency, band, what antenna is selected, maybe the power, and happens to have a, a beam heading um, but thrown in there too. So this object probably would be passed on to a display to show something on the screen so you could keep track of what's going on with the radio. But this is just an example of what one object can contain. So you don't have to send multiple objects with various pieces of data. You can wrap it all up in one JavaScript object and then pass that. So uh, when we get to look at the, the Node Red palette, we'll see there's a bunch of nodes already baked in. Uh, these are some of the, the common ones that you'll see uh, in the stock installation. On the, starting with the left, um, we have some basic functionality to 
inject a message. The top one is called inject, and uh, it it doesn't show up anywhere on on your visual screen when you're running a dashboard, but when you're debugging things, it gives you a little handle that you can click and you can make something happen by clicking on that uh, inject node and it forces a message out uh, to whatever it's connected to. Uh, likewise, the debug uh, node is a great way to see what just came out of it. And there's a, a screen that shows you that what is being uh, captured by that debug node. Uh, there are various you know, other error handling uh, type situation nodes that you can pretty much ignore until you get your head wrapped around stuff. The link nodes uh, basically are connectors to allow you to jump from one place to another and not have to draw a line between them. After you get a lot of nodes dropped in, things start looking like spaghetti. So the link mm -hmm. in and link out are commonly used to, to avoid doing that. And uh, I like to leave comment nodes around that explain what what I've done or what may be going on in any particular area. And then you can just drop those in as you need. Uh, the second column shows some more uh, advanced nodes, which uh, give you opportunities to branch to different directions or change data on the fly, um, check for a range of values. Um, we'll skip the template for now. Um, the trigger was the one I showed you in the first earlier slide that just re can be set to repeat and say one make a clock uh, down to the millisecond granularity. You can have it pulse over and over again. Uh, the other things allow you to do things like run commands on the operating system. The exact command will let you bang a command out to basically a shell prompt, and it will return what it gave you as a result. So you can do things that are actually aren't even written in a node back from the operating system. Filter is another great node for filtering out duplicate data. Now the power starts coming in. Uh, the third column shows parsers, and these things do really heavy lifting for you, especially in HTML and JSON. You'll get to, you'll get to learn what JSON is because that's, that's really the JavaScript object notation that came along with JavaScript, and that is the best way to represent data. Uh, that in the Node-RED environment, but it knows how to, to parse XML and YAML and other formats. Um, you can take strings and turn them into base64 and back just by passing it through this node. The same with uh, the JSON. If you give it a JSON object, it will turn it into text. If you give it text that's properly formatted, it'll turn it back into JSON for you. So uh, basically they do dual purpose. The fourth column shows uh, some things that are only un that are unique if you install Node-RED on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, the biggest thing about a Pi is you have general purpose input output pins uh, to your advantage. And um, when you tell it when you're installing Node-RED that you're going to put it on a Pi, it will add these four on the bottom, the light blue colored nodes, uh, into the palette. And those allow you to, to talk to the I.O. pins by reading them. You can write values out to them. And I haven't used the mouse, but it looks like you can uh, read a mouse that's on a port uh, on the on the Pi. I, I haven't played with that in the keyboard, but it does have access to the mouse and keyboard objects from the underlying operating system. You'll use the GPIO in and outs though a lot if you're gonna start playing with these things. And now on the right, uh, these were user written. These were not included with Node-RED, but they're easy to add in. And if you're uh, uh, if you have flex radios and you want to automate a, a dashboard, these are the way those flows work. These wrap up the complex flex API into a, a nice, nice tight bow and give you access to to read all the information out of the radio and the amplifier and their switches and receive all the metering data and you can paint paint up and make some crazy displays and get rid of the almost get rid of completely the application that flex gives you um, when i when i run uh for instance uh ft8 i start up the uh, flex radio smart sdr and just minimize it because i can do everything i need to do right from my dashboard after that so let's go on any, any quick questions there uh, before we go on? Okay. So here's a quick sample of what uh, a dashboard. Now, a dashboard is just a web page. Uh, Node-RED actually rep 
presents a web server. So what you're doing is you're writing code that runs inside that web server. And if you happen to use any nodes that have visual elements to them, uh, they'll display on a web page that you can design. And so this, this screen shows a quick and dirty little uh, scro uh, scrolling list of buttons uh, that controls a the Belkin Wemo uh, power control switches that I have in my own house. And um, each of these rows is a clickable button. And uh, then I'll show you the flow in a minute, how this works. It's pretty simple. Um, but this flow allows me to do something that the app that Wemo gives you for your cell, your cell or tablet doesn't do. And there's no all on command. And if you want to be able to turn everything on with one click, uh, you have to do it through the programming interface. And I that's how I did it here. So this is a portion of the flow that is running behind the scenes for that last user interface for the Wemo. And it, it handles two of the buttons. Uh, the front door button where I have a, a Wemo on the front door light. And it also handles that all on off. So if we start uh, from the left, you'll see some some green, uh, a green node called front door. Uh, that is reading the state of the switch. So whenever that state changes, if you push the switch physically or if you controlled it from the app they give you, an event will fire out of this node and it'll move into your flow. And in this case, uh, the next is a change node, which just changes a value that comes out to be a little bit easier to work with. It's just moving, it's basically a variable assignment. Uh, without writing any code, it's assigning one variable to another. And that's that's what this node is doing for you. And we'll look at what's inside the following function next, because that's where the meat and the sandwich occurs. Uh, but it's basically just some JavaScript to change the color of this button, because I would like it to turn red when it's on, and I like it to change to a lighter color when it's off. So we'll wrap up some code in this function and do just that. Otherwise, the button doesn't know what to do. It will click and give an event, but it doesn't know anything's happened unless you tell it. So this flow does just that. The event that something happened on the front door would move in through the function. And if it's on, it would light it up red. And if it's being turned off, it will turn it to whatever my off color was, kind of a grayish color. The toggle node here is another built-in node that just holds a variable for you. That's whether it's on or off. That's all it does. And, and it allows you to set it up to where if anything comes in, it'll toggle it to the other state. So it's stuff you don't have to really write yourself. And then coming out of the toggle, we force it back to the output node. Uh, these nodes are actually different, even though they look mostly the same. Uh, the one on the right actually sends the command back to the Wemo. So if I click on my little interface button, It'll toggle and then send it out to the switch, and the switch will actually change. Um, pretty much the same thing is going on here in the all on off button uh, flow at, at the bottom, uh, except it's just a different button. And it, the only difference is, is when it comes out of the toggle, it jumps to one of those link nodes. And you'll see at the top, those wire connectors, I've called them, are linking together. So it goes out the bottom one and comes back in the top one, and it ends up routing to the the, the node that sends it to the MIMO. So it allows you to, to not have all these connecting lines jumping across everything. It, it makes for easier reading. Um, if you do want to download uh, this flow, I've got this uh, link that you can click on. Um, this this By the way, this... This uh, slide deck is available on my QRZ page right now. You can go to it and download uh, the, that link. This this will click straight to my uh, on this PDF. If you get the PDF, you can click on this link too from the PDF and, and get this flow and play with it yourself. So if we double click on the function node, this is where your JavaScript hat has to be on because you actually have to write code. But this gives you the full capability, if you ever did any JavaScript before, or if you're an old-time C programmer, JavaScript will look pretty familiar. Uh, the constructs are very much the same. It's just a little more forgiving on variable declarations. Um, 
All this function is doing is grabbing a value called message.payload. So any anytime a node receives uh, an input, which would be from the little uh, connection dot, if you look on the left of the function, there's an input on the left and the outputs are usually on the right. So the message that arrives comes in and it's usually assigned into a value or property called payload. And I just am saving that as a variable called state. Um, I create a new variable called front floods, and we use that just to put the label on the button because uh, that gets passed on to the button. And all this hula here is just a, a test to see if the state was on. And I basically change the color of the button to have a background of red, which is what this background statement, this uh, hashtag uh, uh, six character hex uh, value is the, if you're familiar with doing web page design and CSS, uh, this is the official CSS co color code for a specific color. You can use those directly. Or as you can see above that, where it says message.color, black is, is one of the base colors, uh, the normal colors uh, that you're uh, used to using can be also used black, green, red, whatnot. That'll get you going. But if you want a specific color, you can give it exactly down to the bit what color you might want. And these are two examples of that. So we came in at the top, we read the payload, we tested that variable state, whether it's on or off. I also have uh, a, a test for whether it's zero or one. So this function would work whether or not it got a one or on into it. That's all this is doing. And at the bottom, uh, as most functions uh, usually return something, this returns anything that I've changed. So I assign values in here, black, a new color for red, and then the label for front floods in this case, that gets returned out of the function by the return statement, return MSG there at the bottom. So that will pop out at the, the little dot on the right-hand side of the function, go right on to the next node, and hopefully the next node will know what to do with all that information. But this is what you can do in very simple form inside a function node uh, within uh, node red. I like to do it uh, to do um, more heavy lifting, but you can get a lot done without ever writing code. So here's another example of a, a simple little flow that uh, does some heavy lifting without you ever even knowing how to, how to do HTTP. Uh, there is a request node, which will make a, a web hit to a web server for you. You give it the URL. In this case, I've got that URL mentioned at the top that's in, embedded into this node. You usually can drill into these nodes and give it certain properties that it needs to operate. This is the one you tell it. You tell it what address to go to. And anytime it gets a tickle from the input side, and that's uh, this update crew, which is a button, this light blue uh, color is typical of any nodes that have visual characteristics. So they will show up on your dashboard. So I had a button called update crew, which is clickable. Anytime you click it, that just tickles the HTTP request node, goes out, fetches something from this uh, URL, it's a JSON file in actuality. Um, and then inside the function node, I take a look at it and I uh, parse it out and throw it into another visual element, which with this, with this one uh, node that's marked crew here, it creates a full grid on your dashboard. So you can kind of like an Excel grid would be, you can throw data uh, tabular wise into a, a dashboard and line and everything can line up that way. So that's what will show up when the the information comes out from this. This happens to go out and gather the active crew list for the ISS and uh, I displays them in the grid, but then in the loop down below, loop through the crew names, which is yet another function, I iterate through each of the names and I send it to an interesting node that comes with node red that knows how to talk to your sound card and will do text to speech. So you could uh, use this to speak text that's uh, that's coming into it. So you could easily use this to automate things that uh, may, uh, you can leave your dashboard up and automate things that 
you might not be paying attention to. And all of a sudden your speakers will start uh, announcing things like spots. Maybe you could use it for uh, POTA spots. You could use it for things. I use it for weather announcements on my, in my flows. So this is uh, what that flow looks like. This is the grid on the right. And those are the actual current uh, crew members that are on uh, the ISS right now. Um, you could uh, uh, use this for any kind of data that you would like to do uh, to display. And uh, to, as an example, I think you'll be able to hear this. Uh, I can play what it sounds like. Current crew on the International Space Station is Jasmine Mokabili, Andreas Mogensen, Satoshi Furikawa, Konstantin Borisov, Oleg Kononenko, Nikolai Chubb, Laurel O'Hara. <laughs> Probably did a better job than I would do pronouncing some of those names. So uh, if we look in that function, um, if you... Uh, we're following along, we, we noticed that uh, the prior function, I had something come in and then it just exited and you got one shot at doing whatever you're going to do. But you don't have to let it do that. You can actually use standard JavaScript constructs. And in this case, I created a loop to loop through an array, which is what was passed in of each of the names separately. And using a, a, a slightly different syntax, you can keep sp spitting out messages out of the node. You're still inside the node, but you can send out multiple outputs uh, as needed. And then at the bottom, when you see a return null, that means nothing else is being returned. So nothing's gonna be passed. But this loop iterates through however many items were in the, the array that had the, array, the uh, crew member names and just takes each one in turn and sends it out to the audio node. So that's how easily uh, things can be modified uh, inside a function node. Uh, the neat thing about using a Raspberry Pi is it's really low power. You can turn it on and forget about it. It's not going to run up your power bill. Um, it doesn't get interrupted by Windows updates. Although you can run this on your Windows computer as long as you make sure uh, it's it's always turned on when you need it. Uh, but the biggest part of using a Raspberry Pi is the IO pins that are part of the, the header on the Pi. And what can you do with those? Well, let's control some relays with these things. So this is uh, one of the relay boards I have. Um, this is the actual production uh, Pi that I have running uh, my dashboard on. Uh, it's got more connections to it now. In this shot, it only had, uh, I think, two relays wired up. Uh, this this board is uh, uh, a neat because it mounts on DIN rails, so you can mount rails on a board and then snap this on it, and it holds the Pi for you. Um, and on the lower left corner, you can see two nodes that come with the node red that talk to the, the I.O. pins. One allows you to read what the current value is. In this case, we're probably only using the outputs. So you can say, if you send a one or a on to this node, it'll happily set that IO pin high for you. And in this case, it turns on whatever relay that's connected to that IO pin. So it's pretty easy to turn off and on stuff from node red using something like this. Now, um, for the past couple of years, I've been involved with the uh, Northern California DX Foundation, uh, helping them uh, create uh, the uh, rapid deployment radios that have been used uh, in hard to get access islands uh, for de expeditions. And um, we'll take a look at what I've done here. So this is the one of the original radio in a boxes. This was uh, created by Alpha Alpha 7 uh, Japan Victor, uh, um, George Walner. And this, this box is bigger than it looks. Um, it looks more like a coffin in size. They're very large, uh, but inside it, you can see it's packed full of stuff. Um, what do we got here? Well, starting from the right side, we have a typical uh, 40 amps uh, switch mode power supply. Um, there is a 50 volt power supply. 
uh, that comes next. And the blue cylinders are supercapacitors. There's there's uh, 83 farads of supercaps paralleled right there. That's used to buffer the 50 volt uh, power supply to the one kilowatt power amp that is next in the wire, the uh, aluminum frame. So uh, it doesn't beat up the generator as bad. And uh, that helps out a lot on, on uh, gas consumption with the generator. Um, under to the next, you can see a kind of a green circuit board. And underneath that is a black uh, box. That is the uh, Flex Radio 6700. There's some networking equipment in here. And that green board is what I uh, got involved with. Uh, we're going to see that in a minute. This is that green board, and on it is a Raspberry Pi and a additional uh, data acquisition board that provides A to D converters and extra uh, inputs and outputs. Uh, that goes on to a, a adapter board that George made that interfaces to everything we need to talk to in that box. Uh, for the most part, that amplifier uh, was a homebrew one kilowatt amplifier, LD MOS amp. There's no instrumentation. There's no uh, API to talk to it. It's just an amplifier. So how are we going to know how it's operating? So uh, we are using brute force uh, measurement of a typical transmatch in line with the amplifier. And I'm, I'm looking at the forward and reverse uh, powers and converting them to SWR. Uh, plus, we have lots of outputs for controlling uh, other aspects of the, the, uh, the rib. Now that was then. Uh, this is now. This is very new. These, this, there's only uh, two of these in existence right now. This is the new portable rib. Um, it incorporates in that left-hand uh, beige box two Flex 6 T700 uh, radios, not just one. It has two uh, bandpass filters, which are mainly designed for receive filtering, and the Raspberry Pi controller, which you just saw. And then in the middle box, there's a 500 watt uh, power amplifier that's connected to one of the radios. And uh, the right hand box is a, a bandpass filter uh, that's automatically slaved to the same radio with the amplifier. And the other the other radio was just run <laughs> and operated carefully. The whole thing uh, is sealed up as you see and is water cooled. Uh, same with the prior rib, the big one. The, uh, these chillers are pretty much uh, mainstays in PC compu uh, computer days. Uh, these are just uh, water water chillers, and there's a, a cold plate system inside underneath the uh, amplifier heat sink and uh, inside the radio pack as well. So uh, these are sealed up and can get wet. Now, how do we control that? Well, this is the dashboard that I created to do just that for this new portable rib, which has two radios, uh, we mainly need control of the amplifier. So you'll see uh, the node red dashboard here uh, is, is pretty full of stuff, but it, it tells us everything we need to know about what's going on inside there. We've got forward power indicator. We've got the SWR. We've got the uh, power amplifier temperature. Um, we have the ability to, uh, to operate uh, or, uh, or stand by the amplifier. Uh, there's a specialized antenna tuner that goes with the system and the extend uh, button and the reset button uh, go along with that. Um, there's other telemetry uh, for voltages and, and, and uh, temperatures here you can see and uh, various uh, other switching for the uh, four-way uh, receive antenna system. You can click on that and it'll change that around. We have controls for the two generators that run different, uh, two different amplifier, two different ribs at the same time, um, and uh, control of the eco mode. These are Honda generators, so they can run at slow RPM if they're not being heavily loaded. Um, these are intended to be to put on an island, and these are connected via a 900 megahertz uh, Ethernet bridge to uh, uh, to a boat where the uh, operators actually sit, or uh, they are remotely controlled via the internet and a Starlink connection uh, worldwide. 
So uh, that's that's how this is set up. This control panel is available to anyone who's controlling that rib. It doesn't have to, to be on the boat. Uh, and so um, we have to know about things about whether the generator is running or not. So we get feedback with indicators on this page whether the generator is still uh, running or if they're in the eco mode or not. Um, and that's what all this does, uh, including power for the radio cycles and stuff like that. So. Uh, a lot of stuff going on in this one little screen, which we park on the side of of the of the laptop screen, and and the uh, radio operating software would be to the side of it. So, this is just a small portion of what is going on inside uh, the flows for the rib. Uh, this particular screen shows uh, the the handling I'm doing to read the A to D converters uh, on the left, kind of in the center, there's a node that's gray that's marked ADC zero, and there's one marked ADC one. That's the forward and reverse voltages that we're measuring off the transmatch after the amplifier. Um, those are just digitized into voltages. And depending on whether um, the operating state is in standby or operate, it branches into various nodes that scale those voltages into realistic numbers. Uh, and then over to the right there, the blue nodes are the graphics you saw on that dashboard, the RF power meter. That's a bar graph object that's built into Node Red. You don't have to do anything to make a bar graph. You just drop that node on there and give it data, and it will happily paint the bars in for you. I also have uh, just raw digit uh, labels so I can see the actual numbers displaying. But this is this is just a portion of how uh, your your flows can get complicated. Uh, but if you look at it a little bit at a time, you can you can usually you know slice off your your problem uh, problems a little at a time. And if as long as you stay organized, you can tackle some really large uh, projects with it. Now. Uh, as Rob says, uh, what can I do with this? Uh, well, uh, we're talking about ham radio here, and and pretty much these days, uh, everybody wants to be able to remote control their station when they're away, if they actually have it set up to do so. So what Node Red does is allow you to do things that eh, wraps up all the the things that uh, end up using two, three, or four different uh, applications. Uh, on a, a desktop at the same time. And maybe they have too much uh, on there, too busy information. Maybe you can just thin it down to just the facts, Jack. So, so what Node Red would be used for is controlling the things that aren't already done for you by, say, if we roll back to Flex Radio. Flex Radio already has the radio part handled. If you, uh, you know you can remote into a Flex easily with their software from anywhere in the world and control it and talk. The audio is passed for you. Uh, you can do key to keyboard CW. Um, that is how they, that's their, their market. But, but what about your antenna switch? What about your amplifier? What if it's, if you don't have, even if you have a Flex amplifier, you have to run their Flex program to control that separately. So it gets it gets out of hand, especially if you have um, different brands of things that don't talk to each other. So um, a good place uh, that that you'll uh, be able to find information about ham radio related uh, things are on the Node Red ham radio list on groups that I O. And I'm going to show you some some samples of dashboards that that some people have put up. Uh, here's a pretty one from Dave W two O Z. Uh, he's one of the movers and shakers out there. He'll certainly be one of the first people to respond if you post a question. This is uh, one of his recent dashboards, and he's he's a flex guy, so he's incorporated what he wants to see about his flex radio. On the left um, panel, you can see uh, basic information about the mode and the frequency and the IP address. And that's that's okay, I guess. Uh, he has a Power Genius amplifier, and you can actually see he's brought out all the telemetry that you'd want to see about that amplifier in the second panel. You click the green button, it'll go into operate and back to standby. Um, you can see the temperature and fan speed and things like that on here. Uh, that's all data that's available to you through those uh, Flex Radio nodes I was mentioning earlier. He also has a tuner from Flex, so he's got a panel just devoted to kicking that tuner. And then, whoa, he's got a tune, uh, antenna genius. So he's got their uh, uh, antenna switch as well. So what we have here 
plus the ability on the right to control his rotor and then turn off and on power switches, he doesn't have to look at any of the software that is the original OEM software. He can run everything about his station with this panel. Now, it could be on a workstation panel, but if this is on a, say, an iPad, those buttons are tappable. So you can tap this and operate without a mouse even. So if you have a touch screen monitor, this works the same. Um, the thing about this is, is you can pull this screen up from outside your shack. So if you are in another city or another country, you can remote in, pull up this screen and have it all in your in your hands to, to be able to change. Here's another one. Uh, this guy has taken on some of the newer techniques that uh, are, are, this is really advanced. It, it's very pretty, pretty to some. I don't know about some of the color choices here, but you can see you can go crazy with the complexity of your dashboards. He's got similar information that we had uh, for the Flex, but a lot less of it. He also is controlling a Flex 6700. He looks like he has a 6400 as well. He does have a beam controller. And he has just the facts about frequency and FCR. This is more my style of a, of a dashboard for what I would want to see. Uh, if you're into uh, Hoda, uh, someone here has generated a flow to, to look for spots that are coming in for a given park and I'll track logging uh, for, for the park. If you're running the Poda the on your side, this is this is uh, just a sample of what someone has taken to, uh, to part. It's their, it's something they do a lot and they wanted to solve problems they needed. So they, they, they threw node red at it and this is their dashboard that they use. And then if you uh, are really anal, uh, you, can, you can go crazy. And this is an example of, of really going crazy. Yes, this exists. And uh, you can see he's wrapped up two uh, Sun SDR rigs, uh, or at least two slices on it. There's two slices from the Flex. He has three rotors, and these are clickable objects. So if you click anywhere on that circle, your rotor will follow to the click. So it's very intuitive. Uh, he's got a spot list there using that graphic grid I was talking about earlier. He also has a flex tuner and amp, but he's got all that wrapped up in a tighter space. But he's got a lot going on here. But again, he could be remote and, and have this one screen brought up on his, on his iPad and operate remotely. Now, I don't know who this guy is, but oh yeah, that's me. This is my dashboard. And uh, I have... More of a just the facts jack kind of attitude towards my remote. This this dashboard is set up for remoting. I have uh, I have multiple users that share my station, and uh, it's a flex uh, radio uh, for the most part for the remoting. And this pan these panels uh, allow whoever's connected or and I use this in the shack on a panel too to control uh, which radio gets what antenna, which is the left hand side on the the four by eight switch. Uh, the second panel is the amplifier controls that I wanted to see for the KPA 1500. Um, the 6600 is the radio, and I brought out uh, the power and SWR bar graphs, able to kick the tune power uh, carrier and kick the, a, uh, the ATU in and out. Same with the amplifier, I can do that. Uh, it shows basic information about the operating state of the radio. Uh, I've got a convenience button down there that sets it in uh, into digital mode and enables the DAX so I can uh, run FT8 with just one click. It'll put the radio into the mode I need. Uh, this screenshot was taken while it was in transmit carrier mode, and you can see that the amplifier is showing uh, whatever power it's going to be able to generate with a 13-watt drive. Um, there's some other flows, the solar conditions flow someone posted out there on the group's IO list, and I just dropped it in and then out of the, uh, it works great. Uh, it allows me to keep track on the conditions without having to go to a separate website. Uh, the lightning monitor is something I created. Uh, this is an interesting thing. I'll show you in real life when we're finished with the, with the slideshow here, I can show you my actual live um, panel. We're doing this, but the lightning monitor allows me to uh, configure it so it'll shut down the whole station as soon as a lightning strike crosses within a boundary. In this case, it's set for 15 miles. Uh, the warning setting in this case shows up at the top, and you'll see it says 
118 miles. So that was the last strike that was within the limit I had set. In this case, 1,000 miles is a, a large radius. When I took this shot, there weren't any close uh, storms, so I dialed it way up so I could get something to show up on the top. Um, and then the power sequencer section on the right is talking to that relay board I showed you initially. Uh, it turns off uh, the DC power uh, to the rate, both the, the K3 and the 6600M I have separately, and it does so in, in the proper sequence. Um, I don't just guillotine the power off. I turn 12-volt uh, power on first, and then this flow keeps track of time for me, and then after it's been on for about 10 seconds, then it turns on the remote on signal to the radio, so the radio boots. And then when I slide the toggle switch to off, it does it in reverse for me. So it shuts off the remote signal. And then after about a minute, it removes DC power from the radio. So I don't have to think about what order to do things. It does it for me. That's the beauty of pro programming now, isn't it? So where do we get started? Um, you've probably seen this already, but nodered.org is where you want to go. Um, that's where you can get all kinds of documentation uh, about installing it. Uh, learning how to, to create your flows, um, doing cookbook things that have already been done for you. Um, you uh, creating nodes are kind of an advanced topic. You'll probably not get there in your first year. Uh, let other people do that, but you can create your own nodes. If, you, if you're a JavaScript or Python developer, you can wrap up your logic and then put it in a node and then just drop it on the screen when you need it. And, and allow others to share it. Um, this is another page off of the nodered.org. It shows you that um, many operating systems are supported, the Raspberry Pi, on, on the Debian-based, uh, of course, ones are Pi and Ubuntu. Uh, the Diet Pi distribution is supported. Also, the Red Hat uh, RPM-based stuff, uh, Fedora and CentOS uh, are all RPM-based uh, distributions. They're supported. And Windows as well, uh, of course, you can do on Windows. Uh, you could get started on Windows uh, immediately, and then as you decide you want something to stay running, you can put it on a Pi later and move your flow over to it. So this is the uh, Node Red Ham Radio group on groups.io. Uh, you'll want to join this group, and you'll want to poke around uh, in the files area for starters. I've got it highlighted here showing you the two main things you want to do. Uh, the second one really is where you want to start. Uh, that's the training documents that people have put up to help you get started. A um, lot of detail up there. And then the flows by type uh, is a files area that is exploded with, uh, and this is all ham radio related stuff too. So pretty much the gamut of any kind of hardware ham radio related, most all the products that you know and love if they, can, if they can talk on the network or have serial port access, someone's probably written a flow to talk to it, and you can use that to start with. And then you also want to go to the messages area here. And once you, well, once you subscribe, you'll start getting those messages. But you can, you can ask questions here, and everybody's really nice about helping uh, new people come along and get it going. So a couple other resources. Uh, there's there are no red uh, as a node red to, a YouTube channel you'd probably want to check out. Um, this Steve's no red guide I found first. Uh, he's got a lot of great videos out on on uh, the the YouTube area too. I have the link here for the node red list I was just describing, so you can uh, go straight to it from here if you like. And that is the dog and pony show as far as the slide deck. Uh, it's been cricket so far. Is there any questions that anybody has? Would you like to go back and look at anything? Or would you like to see if I can figure out how to share my real screen? Pretty slick. That is absolutely not what I would expect in tonight's presentation. In a good way, I hope. In a good way, absolutely. Um, I worked with that style of programming back about the year 2000 in the telecom industry. It's called Master Box. And you could drop these boxes and you had to succeed, fail, and cancel outputs from them. But you had no ability whatsoever to make any modifications to the objects that were there. The idea uh -huh. that you throw together JavaScript and roll your own, that absolutely. I, I will be downloading this thing next week and playing it. 
I can guarantee. <laughs> Okay, I dragged my dashboard over. Did that get show, did that come no. into your view? No. No. Do I need to reshare? Let's see. What is that doing? Let's see. Share me in controls. I'd like to maybe maybe reshare. closing the um yeah, I can do the I can close the PowerPoint. There's nothing left to see in that. Um so yeah, I I mentioned it already, but please go out to my QRZ page. I've put the link up there for the slide deck. It's in PDF form, and you can go back and get a uh, look at those screens again um, and get the and then clickable links are in there. How long well, have you been working with this system? Uh, excuse me? How long have you been working in this well, system? Well, uh, I've been a professional software developer since, well, 1985. Uh, so I have... A lot of languages under my belt, but JavaScript was really never my forte. But uh, I started way back in in Assembler and have come up through the ranks. Uh, I'm now a C sharp and and yeah. uh, well, that's now. But I'm also a, a power builder and Visual Basic developer as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Started with DBase. Um, but um, as far as Node Red, eh, uh, three years, I think three years. No, but uh, you will find the curve is very steep for the first day. <laughs> and then when you start looking at other people's flows uh, and maybe something that you want solved, if someone's got something like it and you install it, you start poking in on it, you're like, aha, oh, okay. Uh, then you'll 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 fly. Um, you, you and I are, are similar in that we have probably worked in 15 or 20 languages. Yeah. At least, you know, and, and it's, your statement is true. The first day is an uphill struggle on the steep part of the learning curve, and then it falls into place. So, but that, I'm, I'm astounded. I had no idea that that kind of flexibility existed in that environment. So I, this has been a good presentation. Oh, All right. there, look at that. There it is. Okay, so this is the this is the live view uh, of the dashboard that is running. Um, let's see if I can move the yeah. Okay, so on the left is the antenna switch. If I click that button, all the all the ports get turned off. Uh, so this represents a four by eight. I only have uh, two antennas on it right now, and a dummy load on port eight. So this would be port one of the flex is set to one. Uh, the, this is the, that's the OCF in that case. And this is a vertical, uh, there, uh, and then I could put it on the dummy load, uh, because I've got logic behind this, it won't let me choose the same antenna on the other, on any of the other radios. Um, you can't hear it, but my, I've got an antenna controller here that's beeping at me. Uh, if you get it there, it'll take it away. So it's enforcing the logic. You don't want to connect two radios together. Uh, and that's what that is. Since I run diversity a lot, I have a hot button up here that just puts antenna one on the first uh, uh, um, slice and then antenna two on the second slice, and it throws the flex into diversity mode for me. Um, so that's neat. That's neat. Uh, the little LED up here on the top means the radio, or in this case, the switch is pinging. Uh, this mean the green line on the flex means it's pinging. But the amplifier is not on. So if I come over here down to the bottom of the amplifier panel and there's a slide toggle switch, I'm just going to click on that. And behind me, I just heard a bunch of relays click. And the amplifier just clicked on. And I can see the power rail is up. And it's now ready to go online. Uh, the third panel is based on just for the radio application. So uh, right now the amplifier is in standby. So we'll we'll leave that alone. Let's say I kick a tune carrier on the radio. And I'm getting about a 1.38 there without the tuner on the particular frequency it's on. If I hit the ATU, it causes a tune cycle. And now the ATU is on and I got a 1.2. So this is coming out of the, I'm not looking at the, you know, the flex application at all. I just did a tune cycle on it. Um, I can um, change global profile, which is, this is one of the ways that uh, I let others use my station. Um, they can get to keep their own profiles in the flex world. That's kind of like a memory preset for everything about the radio. So um, when HC5DX logs in from Ecuador, uh, he selects his call sign and it puts back what he last used. Um, 
the soil conditions are now up to date there. Here's an example of the lightning monitor. If I open this thing out to like 2,500 miles, we can see an active list here at the top within 2,500 miles now, the closest at the 338, the last hit. You can see here on the right, it's showing each count and how far away it was. And if it's in within the circle of the warning, like there and to us, if I make it 500 miles, it'll still count. And you can see that we're within 500 miles, 317 miles away. So if if it triggers within 15 miles, it runs a shutdown. It gives me a 30 second countdown verbally and a button I can click to cancel it if I happen to be watching it or operating. If I don't hit that cancel button 30 seconds later, it turns off the radio. It turns off the amplifier. It turns the antenna switch to off in all positions and then shuts off everything else it can control down. That's what this all this flow does. And this, let's see if I can shrink this a little bit. Like, this is just the, this is the workspace for Node Red. And this is just a web browser view to the Pi. Uh, it happens to be on a different port than normal web pages are served on. In this case, out of the box, it serves on port 1880. So the URL will have a colon 1880 in it. Um, on the left is the palette. These are nodes that have code baked in for you to use. And you just grab one off. Say I wanted to ping a host and find out if it's alive and do something based on if it is or not, I just grab the ping and I drop it in here and I'm double clicking on it and I'll fill in any of the properties it needs. In this case, it's defaulting to Google. And um, right now it's not gonna do anything interesting, but if I, if I come up here to debug and I'm gonna drop a debug node there and I'm gonna take my mouse and I see how I'm hovering over the output node on ping, it turns orange. If I click the left mouse and drag, it will draw a wire. Boom, that's wired up. It hasn't been deployed yet, so it's not actually burned into the flows yet. But up on the upper right, you see now there's a red button that's lit up deploy. When I click deploy, it makes it so. Now it looks like I've got an error in here because there's a triangle showing up here. And what is it? Well, it didn't like this target. So that was actually just a, a guideline there. So why don't we actually, let's just ping Google's uh, name server. Now, what does this debug node do? Well, it shows up in a view on the panel on the right over here. So I'm gonna deploy again and we should start seeing, should see, Pings. Why is it not pinging? Oh, no, it should start pinging. Let's see, timed. Oh, 20 seconds. Oh, let's shorten that down to, let's ping it every one second and automatic and deploy it again. So it was doing what it was told. It was only doing it once a second. Now it's pinging it once a second. So for some reason, it's not able to get out and find that server but it's returning a false <laughs> i don't know why it should be piggy um i'll address that later but this is what a debug nodes allows you to do you can see i've got debug nodes uh throughout uh, i'm going to disable that so it doesn't get in the way i can simply choose a property down on the bottom corner and then redeploy it'll leave the node there but it will disable it so it won't run um Here's a, an interesting one. I'm going to clear that information. Uh, this is a case of a UDP node. So it, working with TCP and UDP is very easy. So if you have an API to any of your devices that allow you to talk to a switch or uh, antenna, uh, a radio can be pulled like a K4 has an Ethernet port baked into it now. And you can you can basically do cat commands straight to the Ethernet port on the K4 and return the values and do what you want with them. In this example, um, UDP 5034 is giving information for my Hamation radio uh, uh, antenna switch. And if I turn this on, let's see if that starts doing anything here. It should, 
Yeah, look at that. So this this packet just came out of that UDP node. So it's listening on port 5334, 53, which happens to be the port that my antenna switch server is broadcasting on. So those are all the same. So I'm just going to pause that. This is a JavaScript object. So you can see here the properties that are coming are coming out of that object. And uh, it's been turned into uh, an object. It was JSON text coming out of this. And it's turned into a JSON object by this node, right? And I'm not sure you can see my, my mouse, but this is the JSON node that's doing the heavy lifting, turning text into a JSON object for me. And over here on the side here, you can see all the properties that I'm spitting out of that server. Uh, this is a custom custom controller that I've built. Uh, this is not available uh, anywhere, but it allows me to talk to Hamation brand uh, antenna switches that use the Hamation um, or the Shackland protocol. Um, so this happens to tell me the statuses. In this case, I'm going to open up the radio values down here. Let's see. We can see ID. So switch number one, radio one is, is set to port one and radio two is set to antenna two. If I come over here, if I come back actually to here and change that around a little bit, say I set radio port one to number two and this one I'll put on the dummy load. We come back over here and then turn back on our debug. I'm gonna clear it so we get a fresh one. Let's make sure we get a fresher, fresh one there. We should get another one. Okay, we've got another one. You'll see that all I've done is uh, now I see that I have radio two is on port two, the antenna two, and there's uh, the second port is on port eight. So this information allows me to um, display this graphic uh, where I want it to show up. So this visually shows me which antenna is selected, but they're also clickable. So uh, this is how complicated it can get, um, but if you do it a little at a time, um, it's it's not that bad. Uh, these are all test things down here. Uh, my controller handles external relays on I2C bus. So I've got some testers here that allow me to iterate the commands that set any of those relays off and on for testing. Um, here's an interesting node that does a lot of heavy lifting for you. It's basically, if you're a developer, you know what a case statement or a switch statement is. This, this node does a, implements a switch statement. So it takes whatever value comes in the message dot topic property. And if it's equal to one, and this is a number, you can make it test strings, you can do expressions. If it's a numeric one, it sends that message out this first port. If it's, you know, uh, it's kind of hard to see now that I've opened this up, but uh, this, this particular uh, switch node it ha it can have as many cho choices as you need. You just click the add button and add more. In this case, I have six. So you can see six outputs here on this node, uh, those get special handling depending on which switch is there. Um, those happen to jump into different places. In the case of uh, radio one, it goes here. If it's radio two, it would go here, here, and here. I don't know if you can really see me doing this, but so it, these are the connectors and links I was talking about. If you click on a link, see how it draws the dotted lines? It tells you where it's linked when you just want to inspect where that's going. It's pretty easy to see. Um, now, across the top, you can see tabs. These are actually called flows on their own. This is a flow. This is another flow. So multiple flows are running at the same time. Uh, it's all event driven. It's multitasking. So everything's happening at once. It doesn't matter how much you stack in here. So this tab for organizational purposes has all the stuff that I need to make the this panel here work, the KPA 1500 panel, uh, the second panel from the left. This flow makes that work. Likewise, uh, the flex, let's see, the flex radio node, uh, or flow uh, is what does this middle node here. 
So you can organize your flows or, or even pare them down to smaller things. This is the power sequencer flow. It handles the two little toggle switches. Um, I see I have a pinger in here. So you can see uh, I've got some little LED objects on my flow. So if we come back out here, we can see here's the ping light if the under the radio power sequencer third or fourth column from the left you can see the the green ping light is flickering that's because this guy is pinging uh that radio and telling me it's on that's all it's doing but it just makes me feel good i can see because sometimes the flex doesn't boot due to issues they've had over the years and even though i give it power and it thinks it's on the light will still be red and i'll know the radio's dead so um, that's just fyi uh, is there any other questions or does anybody want to see anything spe specific um i'd like to, um as i'm assuming this generates some kind of source code behind the scenes i guess it's uh javascript not really <laughs> <laughs> no uh basically when you hit deploy uh since it's javascript it's interpreted uh and it gets pushed in it's actually evaluated and run by um this this the back end which is that's which is the reason why it's called node red which is node it's a web server uh the node server but it's really running javascript um uh, wow. so if i go into any of these the kind of the right now any of these function nodes they have a little curl uh, cursive f uh, icon these have javascript in them all of these have javascript in them so for instance this is the set k4 diversity that's really uh no longer working because the k4 isn't online here anymore but you can see it has javascript code in here um and basically I formulate out a command. Here's the K4 command to put uh, a K4 into diversity mode. And here's the command to take it out of diversity mode. So is there any way that you could version control that? Yes. Uh, I don't have it enabled. Um, and this, on uh, I don't have version control enabled. I do have projects enabled. You can You can set up separate projects, which means you can bop around between different things. And when you change projects, it throws away the flows you had and brings back in the flows for the project you select. And those projects can be tied uh, to GitHub or Git and um, or probably any uh, source control of your choice, but Git would be probably uh, the first one I would choose. But yes, you can use source control and it allows you, to, uh, it shows you to diff. It'll show you what you're going to check in, just like you would expect from the source control manager. Cool. So one other question, where are you getting the lightning strike information from? Uh, it's a website. Uh, let's see what that might be. Let me clear that screen. I didn't write the original flow, uh, but I enhanced the heck out of it. Uh, it's blitzendorgen.org right there cool. so Thank this um this is kind of hard to follow but the way these nodes work uh this this is an inject node this is one of the very most basic nodes right here on the upper left uh it has a little click handle on the left side of it uh, but when you click the handle, it will kick out a message. In this case, it kicks out just a JavaScript timestamp uh, string. And it could also be anything you want it to be. It could be a number. It could be uh, in a form of a buffer. It could be um, a number. It could be uh, one of the variable types. There, uh, There is a concept of global variables, and there's a concept of flow-based variables. Uh, flow variables are only visible on the tab that you're on. Global variables are visible across the tabs. And um, there's also an instance. Uh, so inside a function, you could actually have a variable that's only visible when your code hits that function and it's it's encapsulated from everyone else. So you could have, you won't have to worry about variable collisions. 
uh, if you repeat, you know, copy the function and use instance variables inside it, that's it's like putting variables on the stack. They go away, but they come back as soon as you come back to that function. Uh, but getting back to the inject node, uh, this is set up to be a repeating at a one minute interval. So what this does is every minute, it just kicks out a, a basic timestamp. The HTTP request node, which follows it, doesn't care about that time step at all but it tells it to do something and that is go get whatever i told it to get so it goes to this url which happens to be a javascript page and it returns something uh in that something we do a little bit of of um, regex matching regex matching to split out some things and we end up dumping it into a, a payload variable to be utilized um in this uh this tab so this node so that's the request the answer goes comes in this node here which i'm moving so we made the request here we parsed it but it and but the res result from that web hit has to be decoded and we do a little bit more funky stuff uh this is programmer gobbledygook but it, it's the the type of expression that comes back from this website is ridiculous uh, but all this who law splits it up into things that we can parse and we end up getting a constant list of hits and if you look down here in this node i've got a a a, a little uh what's a note what's called node status i you can make status things show up on the bottom of these nodes so i have it showing me each hit that comes through uh, and the range it was in kilometers away. Actually, by the time it hits this, I've converted them to miles. They give it to you in kilometers, I convert it to miles. Then I do some logic to uh, see if it's within the setting range. Remember, I had this drop down here of whether it's, you know, within these radiuses. Uh, and also, this also is a radius. Uh, and depending on which one I'm testing for, um, I build a little state machine where if I uh, if it's within the range and uh, it hasn't started yet, it starts a countdown timer here and it counts down for 30 seconds. It speaks out of my speakers that shutdown's in progress. And then 30 seconds later, it'll say shutdown proceeding. And then it uh, says it says uh, it speaks the uh, system was shut down out of my speakers so all that happens without me even touching anything uh, so this is a really cool flow if you have everything brought into node red where it can turn stuff off remember i have everything remotable in here so i turn the radio the amplifier the antenna switch goes to off state and i can power off the dc power to everything uh, that's what makes this flow for the lightning monitor pretty cool. Thanks. Here's that Wemo flow in its full glory. You can see it's just a cop copy paste of each, each button has the same thing over and over again. So you can basically get one going and then copy and paste it. Um, it's pretty easy to export and import. Uh, the menu here allows you to grab uh flows uh from somewhere and paste mm -hmm. you can paste the J the json uh formatted uh flow into this box and it will import it so if you go out to nodes uh the node red list and you see somebody's flow they posted it or you've downloaded it you could either import it from a file you can choose a file or you can select it by file here or you can um just paste it into this box and either paste it into the current screen or if you choose new flow it'll add a new tab out here and you can see it gets long and distinguished here's that iss uh flow if i just tickle the timestamp, it should current crew on the international start Space speaking Station is there you go oleg kononenko nikolai chow so i wasn't faking it tracy caldwell dyson <laughs> matthew dominic michael barrett importantly i can't stop Jeanette it Epps. Alexander Grabankin, Butch Wilmore, Sunita Williams, Lee Huang Su, Lee Kong, Yet Wang Pu. 
something interesting just happened. Uh, another flow that's in the background. I hadn't touched the radio in within um, 20 minutes, I think is my time right now, maybe 15. And since I hadn't moved the VFO or toggled the PTT in that time frame, the amplifier was told to shut off. So my amplifier just went off by itself. Um, which is great because when I have someone who's remote and they lose connection to the radio and they just disappear, the amplifier shuts off after you know 10 minutes by itself. So that's baked into the flow for the, the amplifier. Uh, but you can take um like this is the where is the amplifier? It is oh, this is it right here. I've used a link probably from both the operate standby button uh, on the radio, the flex radio tab here. I use these use links. I, I don't have to see. Let's see if we can find the operate standby. Where are you? You are. You even can't find my own stuff here. This is so complicated. Uh, what the, 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 oh, the amplifier. So if I the PTT is monitored down here somewhere, and Let's see, that's not the one, but I basically have one of these connectors here jumping to a different flow. And every time the PTT is actuated, I reset a timer and it's, it's, there's a timer, um, countdown timer. It's probably on this flow. Uh, da -da, da -da, da -da. Sorry, we're running long here. Feel free to bail if you have to, but, uh, I'll stay here as long as you guys want to ask questions. No, I will, I will hang around. This is pretty good. Uh, yeah, I'm looking for my little countdown timer here. Where are you? Trust me, it's here somewhere. Um, there's a timer node here somewhere that you can set up, and it counts down when you invoke it. And uh, when it fires, um, if the, here it is right here. So every time something need anytime i i need to reload the watchdog i tickle this input from somewhere so there's three inputs coming in here and uh 20 minutes later this timer will fire and it, it sets up just the payload i need i actually just uh set a flow variable called amp timer is active uh to the value that got passed in it gets passed on uh, but it turns, it sends out the command to turn off the amplifier when it sends that. Um, I also log it to a, a text file so I can see that it timed out. Whenever you click on a link and it gives you this kind of half dotted line thing, that means that's on a different flow. Um, I can click on this and it'll take me to that flow. So here I am jumping in. So I've got this little trace logger thing that allows me to timestamp anything I want to write and it writes it to a text file. So the sky's the limit here, guys. You can work with um, Mosquito if you played with um, uh, sub, uh, pub, 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 pub sub type uh, servers. Uh, it talks directly to MQTT, which is the you know pub sub type servers. So you can post information and, and subscribe to information and, and then get that back. I use that on the ribs. Um, I, have a, I have a flow up here somewhere here, rib trace log. When I enable this, it subscribes to a, a public uh, mosquito server that uh, the ribs post to. So anytime a fault occurs on the rib when they're doing an operation, um, it sends the, the, the error text I need to know about, you know, like say the thermal limit was hit or they're, they're over driving the amplifier and it's faulting uh, or high SWR can't tune. Um, I upload that to the to the cloud, and then my 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 speaker starts speaking out these these errors. So before they even text me that something's you know like the antenna won't tune, what's going on? I go, yeah, yeah, turn down the amplifier. You're overdriving it or something. You know, I already know because my speakers are blurting out these errors every time they occur. Uh, that's something you can do with with uh, mosquito type servers. Um, here are the TCP in and out nodes. Uh, you can also do UDP easily done um is there this a, go ahead sorry is there a node for fermata i have in the past uh used like a raspberry with I believe there is. and do a fermata down to an arduino i believe there is uh so if we take a look over here um if you go to the manage palette option 
Um, this, these are the nodes that I currently have installed. If you go to install, you can search for, you know, like if I search for flex, for instance, here are things that have flex in their name. Um, and if I wanted to install, install one of these guys, for instance, it's as simple as, let's see here, say, let's see, say one of the modulus one here. If I click this install, it'll ask me if I want to look at the information about the node or just, in, just install it, which I'm going to do. Bada bing, in the background, it's downloading that flow, installing it for you, compiling any dependent no nodes that uh, mo modules that needs to run that. And um, as soon as you hit this deploy button at the top, it's available in, and it just added all of these nodes to, to the palette over here when I deploy this. I may not deploy that because that actually is going to clutter up my stuff, but that's how easy it is right there. Now I'm going to abort that by just refreshing the site without deploying. So if I goofed and like, oh, I cut paste, I deleted, I shouldn't have done that. I haven't saved it yet. If I didn't hit the um, the uh, deploy button, so now I'm back to where I was the, at the last time I deployed, right there. So that's an that's another thing that um, you'll <laughs> may run into from time to time. But that's where uh, you install all the palette uh, items that. Um, aren't there by default. Um, let's see. You can import and export these flows pretty easily to JSON files, so you can save them. Uh, like I, I save every time I make a change, usually daily when I'm working on the ribs, I, uh, or even hourly if I'm making a lot of changes, I'll do an export um, and just save the JSON file in case I goof and need to go roll back to it because I'm not working with any version control on those. Has anybody uh, ever used uh, this to uh, like do a uh, horizontal invert, uh, basically rotor control for like satellite? Yes, absolutely. Um, I didn't have a sample in, in, in those shots. I There, there, there are uh, a couple people out there that are doing that. Um, my, let's see, is my, my node is not I don't have my my rotor interface plugged in. Let's see if I can enable the interface. So let's see, where are you? Rotor control. Don't have it on. I, I think I guess I pull it out. So yes, um, as L rotors are have been easily man, uh, manipulated uh, and with control for for the controlling software, and they display, you know. Pretty little pictures and stuff. I don't have an Azel rotor, so I haven't gone to that. Um, let's see. I thought I had my. I guess I pulled it out. I've got this is my production um, Pi. I have a, a dev development Pi, which has more, all my real playground stuff on it. Um, this is the production one. I don't like to break it because uh, this, you know, anytime anybody wants to use my station, I don't want to break it for them. Um, but so I do have a, a dev pie that has probably has that stuff on it, but yes, uh, I would highly recommend starting to go out to the ham radio, uh, node red ham radio group and, um, start at least following the messages. And once you poke around in the files there, if you don't see anything, that's what you're looking for, just make a simple post. Hey, does anybody worked with a yada, yada, this and a yada, yada, that, uh, or written a flow, or does anybody have the API information so I can write my own flow? Uh, people will chime in if they do. So which group is that? Um, <clears throat> it's in the uh, it's in the the slide deck, which I don't want to bring back up, um, but uh, it's the on groups.io, and it's called Node Red Dash Ham Radio. Okay. Are we going to get a copy of the slide deck? Yes. Um, if you go to QRZ and look up this weird guy, KD4Z. Okay. That's, that's me. Um, halfway down the first page, there's a link to uh, a Dropbox link. You can just click on the Dropbox link and you'll get the, the slide deck in PDF form. You can also... Uh, 
find, uh, let's see, what have I got there? Let's see, um, I also did a, if you're interested in, in doing circuit, uh, printed circuit board layouts and doing your own circuit boards, um, I did a, a another presentation to North Fulton two years ago about KiCad. And KiCad, uh, the KiCad uh, slide deck is here as well. Uh, and, I, and the presentation on KiCad uh, is out on, on on YouTube. And it's, it's actually pretty good. Uh, it's about an hour and a half. And uh, it gives you a pretty good idea of how easy it is now to design your own circuit boards. I, I started doing that. Here's one. This is the controller that is controlling the antenna switch that we were just looking at a minute ago. This is my creation. And I, I made this board with KiCad. Um, and there's the board and there's the controller. Is that fiber on the, on the optical? Yes, it is. Uh, this controller uh, can uh, connect to, uh, so I don't think I have a picture of the module, but I I have a, our, uh, let's, this is really talking uh, what they call shack land from the Hamation company. Um, I encapsulate the shack land onto optical and then um, control it from using, uh, you can connect to uh, the, ham, the Hamation switch via optical instead of uh, direct copper hardwired or uh, they use RS-485 it's, it's nothing special but it's a hard copper so you can get galvanic isolation using this controller uh, to the antenna switch by using uh, multi-mode uh, fibers uh, and it'll go like 17 kilometers so no tower is too tall uh, or no back 40 is too far um, so um, this is my creation is based on an ESP32. And uh, this is an earlier board, the relay breakout board for it that has 16 relays. You can stack four of these on top and get 64 relays full control out of this one controller. Um, it also has uh, eight inputs you can read um, on the front and uh, handles uh, the Hamation two by eight and and four by eight switches out of the box. But what kind of power will those relays take? These relays are real small. Uh, these are one amp. Uh, normally, these are sing they're only normally uh, the single pole one amp. Uh, these are designed. These were designed to fire other relays. If you need something bigger, this relay would fire that relay. But I wanted something that would be a tight switch closure uh, that was expandable. Um, I don't think I got anything down here that's fresher. Let's see. Uh, I also did a an AB switch for HF rigs. This guy allows you to take two HF rigs and and connect the the mic, the paddles, the PTT, the foot switch, and the speaker audio, uh, and have it all switchable with a single push button. Uh, between one radio and the other. So you could A, B the radios instantly <laughs> with the same speakers, same metal, but switch, you know, mic, everything gets swapped. Um, that, that's a fun little project there. Uh, I've been building high isolation antenna switches. Oh, I, you may have seen this. Um, I did the board for the North Fulton CPO uh, board for uh, W4QO uh, back in the day. And um, we, we sell these at our ham fests or every ham fest. Um, they're about 10 bucks. Is that um, on KiCad? You can go to the Narfl site and order these. Uh, clubs can order them at a lower price. Um, they're great. We're going to use, we, uh, I think we actually used these at the at the HamFest last week uh, as for the, the, the soldering. We usually do a soldering project for the kids. Uh, I didn't get to go to the HamFest, but I, I believe we did a, a soldering se a session. And these were the kits that they were putting together. Um, that's the circuit diagram. It's nothing special. I don't think there's much here. This goes way back in my earlier days. This is a bog <laughs> switch controller for beverage on the ground switching. But uh, I don't have all the pictures from some of the antenna switches, but I, I've been building some really, really high isolation uh, switches. This one's, this is getting up there. This one has port to port uh, 
on let's see what that's oh six meters i'm i'm reaching 97 db um most antenna switches if you use them in reverse like you have two radios and one and you know, like you're switching two radios into one antenna for this, in this case, like a two to one. Uh, you've got to be careful if the radio isolation or the port to port isolation isn't high enough, you can get a lot of energy in the other radio. Uh, and like on DX engineering, the best things they sell only have 70 dB of port to port isolation. That's probably okay at 100 watts, but if you're running power, not so much. Um, mind achieve uh, quite a bit more uh I'm, I'm well over 100 db on 80 uh, meters uh, even 10 meters i'm at 110 db down uh for isolation so um i wish i had i don't have any other really neat pictures i've got a four by one as well that ha that has uh, 100 db on six meters uh nobody's doing that you can't buy that and it'll take california kilowatt power too what about that four by eight that you're using? That, that one. Four by eight has about eighty-five dB. I, of course, that's the Shackland product. Um, that's about eighty-five dB. It's not terrible, uh, and I'm using it uh, stock, uh, and I I haven't had any trouble. Uh, but I do not run it. I don't run high power through it. Uh, my fifteen hundred is downstream on only on the port one antenna, so it's it's only getting the dry, uh, you know, up to 100 watts uh, exciter power on the switch. Uh, but it's supposed to take that kind of power. Um, but I would probably want to use my own switches if I'm actually having to run amplifiers ahead of the switch because uh, I don't I don't think 85 dB is enough. Um, is there anything else anybody wants to see? I'm, uh, I've, got, I've got another question. Yeah. What's the, um, the dashboard design tool look like where you're laying out where you want the buttons? Oh, and the good question. So there you go. So over here uh, in the, we call this the hamburger menu. Uh, let's see. First of all, let me bring out the flyout. You've got to click this to bring this back. Um, it's really not on the hamburger menu. It's on this menu. You go to dashboard and this allows you to lay out how you see things on on the dashboard um i have a hamburger menu on mine so notice when i click it i've got all these other options like here's that wemo controller when i turn on the front lights boom the front lights are on here that's the flow um uh, i can swap back to the uh this is the that's the logger for the ribs they're not online right now uh no that's the rib log it's not online right now um there's the ISS uh, that if I click that, it would run the ISS flow, but see how I've got a menu for separate complete flows. So uh, over here, you get to define those. Uh, as here are those breakdowns right here on the right. You see I'm moving the, across the layouts for that hamburger menu. Um, there is the ISS and there's the WeMo, and then here's my KDC, KDPRZ control. So that becomes the title here um, and then each of the flows you have in that group and uh, are buried on, on each one so i could drag these around and change the order in the hamburger menu just by dragging these around but the question is how do you do the layout and if you hover over the main flow you'll see there's a layout button and there it is so I've got this set up in what they, they have a, kind of a, a default block size. They, and it's set up by these width settings at the top. So I've got basically the flows are all designed to fit in a six width block. Um, so here is, uh, well, let's see. Um, let's take something that doesn't matter let's try well let's say i want to move i've got an lp 500 flow uh here uh, i was the first guy to actually make the lp 100 uh, lp 500 uh, and 700 work with node red um so i've got a flow that does that so if i wanted to move that button around i just grab it around and it would move it on the on the dashboard when i hit say done here and then redeployed it so i could swap stuff around I can resize it in here. That's how you do it.
And those are the titles of the buttons that relate to the code. These are the titles, uh, the name property. So um, like here, if this is, um, let's see, that's uh, that's one of the values right there. This name shows up in that screen. And that matches to that to that button. That matches to the, that's what I happen to name this button. Uh, and then when you get into the layout, you would see that. So you can tell um, it's, it depends on how long your names are. Uh, if they get too long, you might not see it, but you can, you can, I think it has a balloon help. Let's say yes. So if it's too big to see like this guy right here, hover over it. And that's the RX bypass B button. And that is the frequency B button. And this is frequency A button, so forth like that. So it's got a name and a type, I guess. Yeah. Yes, the that is the type. Uh, that's the 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 node type. Um, in this case, it's probably a template. Temp if you're good with CSS, if you can write your own CSS uh, script, there is a node that is simply a blank template slate, and you can drop a running, basically run a whole web page inside that node. And so people can drop other web pages inside their dashboard uh, pretty easily. Um, I don't have any to show you, but that's, it's it's doable with the template node. So it's not just CSS, it's the HTML with it? It, it can be. I use CSS uh, on, let's see, see that how these buttons are rounded? That's just CSS. Oh, so okay. the, the flex diversity button, where are you? Let's see where to go. Flex mode, diversity. You basically group up your CSS in one node and then refer to it. So I've got these groups set up. Here's some. Um, these are used for, uh, this is basically used for this meter or this, this, this paradigm here that sets up the percentages that occur when uh, this is rendered and that's all done in CSS. So this sets up whether it's a, a four-way toggle or a three-way toggle or a two-way toggle, or in this case, it's a, a, it's a nine-way toggle. Um, and you can set up your groups, font size changes, anything you want. And then when you refer to it in, let's see, where's the template? So this is a, this is a template node. So, this is just a template, and once your classes are defined, you can just refer to them. Um, in this case, the class has properties I can set up, and one of them is rounded. That makes the button round instead of square. Um, I can, I can just, I can tell it this is what gets sent out when I click that button. So it sends out a JavaScript object that has a, prop, a payload property, which is the default property that everything pretty much wants to see that comes out of the palette. Um, you always usually needs a payload. And that at the payload, and as in JavaScript, is not, not type specific. It can be a string one minute and a number the next. It sucks. But uh, as a programmer, you, you can get sloppy. Uh, if you don't watch out with that, but in this case, I'm sending out um, whatever I'm sending. I want to, whatever is uh, in the payload. Uh, and then I set up another property called K4 underscore div in the topic, uh, which then I test for somewhere else. And if it, the topic is what I'm looking for, uh, you know, it's probably tested here. If the payload is on and the topic was something else. Uh, it depends on how I've set this up, uh, but this gets down into the nitty gritty of JavaScript, and I don't want to bury the guys that aren't ready for that yet, but um, you can go as deep as you want with this, and it's fast. I mean, literally, the only time I've seen speed problems are the fact that I needed power values out of that coupler off that A to D board for the bribs fast enough that I got SWR and power readings that were realistic. <laughs> so I had to run the thing flat out basically. And I basically, it's about every 20, I think 30 millisecond uh, polar rate is as fast as I can run it. 
Uh, and then I think I clog up the message queue uh, on the Pi, or I'm clogging the the bus that's talking to the ADD board. But that's the only time I've ever seen it run out of horsepower. Because uh, basically, everything's event driven. It's not doing anything until you click something, or if you've got something that's constantly running, yes. But that's why the Pi can do this so well, because not much is going on until something happens. What else can I answer? Well, hey, um, Warren, go ahead, Lynn. Oh, I was just going to say, um, how you're talking about uh, uh, continuous data. I was wondering, like, FIR filters or even a moving point average, It, I assume it has the math to do that? Well, any, any, <clears throat> there are math nodes, uh, which I don't use because I'd rather just code it in JavaScript. So you can include the math library and everything that, uh, or you can include your, include your own libraries when you, in the background for the node server, you can declare it. So it's available to you in your, your uh, workspace. So if you've got some of the heavy lifting in a, in a, a library, you can add, you can call into uh, Python as well. Um, as a matter of fact, um, that A to D board call, has JavaScript that's wrapping Python scripts that are actually doing the heavy lifting to talk to the board. So that's that's probably another layer why it's actually jammable because <laughs> it is doing that double layer uh, at, at such a high rate, uh, getting the digitized. I am digitizing the two channels forward and reverse power as fast as I can so I can get response times that look realistic on the, on the dashboard. They look pretty good. I mean, they're fast enough that the operator can see, yep, that I'm, you know, overdriving or, you know, now mic's not working or, you know, I'm driving it too hard or not driving at all, whatever. SWR is too high. Uh, that's all that, you know, is for is to keep the operator from blowing stuff up. And I've got uh, alarms in here uh, in the in the rib flows. I've got triggers, you know, maximums that we've figured out are where we want and and if they overdrive you know if i if i detect an overdrive state i kick the operator into stand uh, off the amp into standby if the temperature goes over a certain amount i kick it back into standby if the swr is too high i kick it back into standby so i'm trying to idiot proof it how's so that working with the um measuring the power with the a to d it's, it's tough it's coming transmatch it's tough. Yeah, it's only on our transmit um, when we're in receive. Actually, mm -hmm. I think those flows run. Oh, I could actually show you the live throw. Uh, it's if I if I can get there. Let me see if I can. Let me grab an address here uh, that I can show you the live A to D. Um, dum, 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 dum. Let's see where am I? I need another view here. Oh, I won't be able to do that. That's that's on a different machine. Okay, I was going to be able, I thought I was going to show you. I, well, maybe. Now, I don't know if, it, it, let's see. Uh, I'm just curious what the A to D is seeing, you know, what 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 range of. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I can't show that to you. Um, I'd like to show it to you, but yeah. that is, I'm tunneled through a, VP, a tail scale VPN to the device. It's sitting on. George's boat, and he's anchored off of uh, Hawaii right now. <laughs> uh, he's uh, in Hawaii, uh, but the VPN is on is on a screen I'm terminaled into. But I, can, I unless I can get Zoom to share that terminal, <laughs> uh, we might not be able to. Yeah, it's funny. The the, the part about getting it from Hawaii is easy. The part about just getting Zoom to show it. <laughs> yeah. That's, so that's yeah, funny. I mean. It's funny because I have Telscale VPNs into each of the pies and each of the ribs. So behind the scenes, I don't have to interrupt the operator. I can jump in and do things and monitor things. Um, and the thing is, it's sitting on a boat or it's sitting on an island with the boat a half a mile away on an Ethernet link. And I'm jumping to it through Starlink. And, it, and I get like 80 millisecond round trip ping times to Timbuktu. <laughs> And it's all through Starlink. Welcome to the 21st century. Let's see. I think, oh, uh, I could show you the dev. Let's see here. That was on 241. If I got 1,000 watts going into an antenna, I don't think they, I don't want to shoot that into the A to D. 
no, no, no. Uh, we have a standard transmatch coupler, you know, uh, a forward a forward toward and a, a current toward and a voltage toward uh, monitoring the, the direct as a setup in it with a, you know, a diode direction of pepper. You can look up transmatch and see these circuits. So we get a voltage that's characteristic of the forward going amplitude and the reflected amplitude. Oh, okay. That's what I wanted. Okay. So yeah. it comes from that. Okay. And it's, it's low. I mean, it's, and it's not linear. So we have a scale function we've had to calibrate uh, against, um, but it's just a voltage. Um, the, the, the A to D's on this board will, I think will digitize. It'll go over, I think it'll do 10 volts, um, uh, peak to peak. I think we only get about three volts max out of the, the actual coupler. Uh, Let's In see. what eight eight bits sixteen bits? It's uh twelve bit. No, right in the middle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, it's twelve bit. I didn't make it, but okay. Oh yeah. So let's see here. Um, this is my test mule for the rib. This is not actually the rib, but it has the rib flows, at least some rib flows on it. Um. And yes, you can password lock uh, Node Red. So if you um, are worried about, uh, definitely don't port forward the port eighteen eighty out your router, please. Uh, there's already <laughs> script kitties that are banging on Node Red dashboards because of that. Mm. Um, so if you get to the point where you've got your dashboard and you're ready to expose it, only use a VPN. Set up, uh, oh, you know, I use uh, Open VPN directly on my endpoint, and so I open a tunnel on my phone, boom, pull up the direct IP address in the house or people that are remoting in, they have open VPN installed and I, I send them the certificate. And so they tunnel into my network and then pull up the address locally. Uh, but yeah, it's already gotten to the point where, uh, and since you can easily send a blank flow to node red, people are like, Hey, my flow's vanished. <laughs> they didn't have a, even a, a simple basic authentication turned on. So it takes about a day right now, and so, and they'll find you on, on the port eighteen eighty. So it's in the. You can change the port, right? You can change the port in the config for for the Node Red startup um, to anything you want, anything that isn't in use. Um, I leave it on eighteen eighty, and sometimes I redirect it to a different port. Um, but right now, since I'm back down, I've closed all the port, all external port forward. So it's only VPN access. I just leave it on port 1880. Uh, so you can see, uh, let's see, let's go to, oh, well, this is it. So this is the flow. Uh, is that visible to you? Um, you should be able to see this is the flow that's running the, the A to D on, on the ribs. Um, this is, by the way, it's, um, a pie, it's from pie plates, uh, this A to D board. Uh, it's a hat and it has, let's see. And yeah, the guy that does pie plate is here in the Atlanta area. Yeah, he is. Uh, I don't think he sold it. I think he was trying to sell it, but I think he's still here. Uh, it, it, it does eight channels of A to D, plus they give you a free one, uh, that you can use to read the five volt rail of the Pi, which is what this one is right here. So that that's a freebie, but here, so for instance, uh, let's see, ADC zero uh, to, I think it's on the UI, because um, these are the power, let's see, is it over here? Seven. No, it is gonna be over here. So ADC zero, it's going to be where the power is. So this is in that slide deck too. I actually showed this part as the, this is a complicated flow. So I don't have real values here because I don't have a coupler connected to the A to D board. So if you look here, this is a timestamp inject. This is an inject node that's just set to kick out a time step. And it is just set to, uh, Actually, that's a test timestamp. Here is the one I call kickstart. If you look very close, there's a little one in the label. So that tells me it's been set to repeat. Uh, and right now this one's set to repeat at a three second rate. 
uh, that's firing different things. That's the clear on the peak hold. So I have meters that clear after three seconds. So I get a high point and then it gives it three seconds and it clears it. So that's the resetter for that. But these guys, where is it? So it starts here. So you can see this is the ADC zero. This would be considered the four. Uh, would be, this would be the measured value from the voltage and the coupler going forward. So hmm. I don't have anything on it. This is junk. This is just the idle or state uh, open circuit input value it floats to. But that one point three three five three six three four three six. There's the value that the ADC is re reading right now. This is your best friend. That's the filter node. You don't even have to do anything in here, but it will block messages from passing until it's different. So this is really flying. If I bring over the, let me bring out the uh, debug panel and hang a debug node on there. Okay, and we can do selected nodes. Uh, which I'll select here, uh, which I'll put one. Oh, I don't have a don't have a debug panel. So let's grab a debug node. And I'm just going to drop it anywhere, and I'm going to drag a wire up to the debug. See, it's still feeding data to the to the filter node, but I can also split it and view it up here. When I deploy that and then select it, it should flood this debug window over here with values and it is ah, okay so what's interesting though is if if i nuke this wire and i drag it after the filter now it all it'll never repeat it's only showing changes uh, in this case since that last digit is moving yeah it's not helping a lot but um, on slow moving changes, you just, it cuts down the clutter. Uh, you, you definitely want to, to filter data that moves. Um, like I said, um, the, tra the transmatch is not linear. So we had to do some extraordinary uh, things to um, make it uh, linear. And so, before I even did anything, I put it on a precision power supply and I measured the linearity of the ADC and came up with this function that linearizes voltage. So when it reads at you know 1.123 volts, it's 1.123 volts. Uh, and if it's 2.45, it's 2.45. Uh, because it his ADCs are not quite linear. So that's a, a stupid little fudge factor, but it adds, you know, 0.4% on uh multiplies it by 0.47. You had to figure that out by trial and error to get yeah, those numbers. I did. Yeah, I just curve fit it. You know, I just took data points over across the range, put it in Excel, told it to plot it, give me the function. And that's how we also do uh, the scale factor. So um, also we found that uh, the, the um, depending on how the, he's using, um, I'm talking about um, George Walner here, a, a seven a Japan Victor. He used a, a, either from Ukraine somewhere uh the coupler he bought and so it has some some op amp logic on it but it has a dc bias <laughs> it floats uh so we have to we back that bias out in a calibration screen so that at rest we get a zero value on the adc that means then our scale factor uh can kind of play so this is using the simple form of it you know you remember in the old slope intercept form here it is yep. yeah so there we are so we we plot you know low uh, um, power points multiple power points, and then get the slope and then the y intercept is the b here, and I just take the value I measure, throw it through the function and fix it to you know, throw away any decibels and out it goes. There you go. That's right. Y equals m x plus b. Yeah. Yep. That's right. So, um, but it gets worse. Uh, the coupler is not linear on all the bands. So I had to come up with a different scale factor depending on what band the radio's on. How how well does that work? Works just perfectly. Like, just works curious. Great. Works great. So instead of having it hardwired here, 
I turn on this function, you can see I've just got a function called lookup multiplier de declared at the top of this script. You know, it basically jumps over that when it comes in the node. And this is the first line that's actually executed. But internally, I reference, if I turn this on, it's going to call this lookup multiplier function right here. And all I do is look into a glow, I grab a global array that's preset for the whatever band I'm already on. Oh. And I set it as I, I grab the multiplier out of the array based on the band ordinal, which is a globe, which is which is saved globally. Anytime the band bits on the radio change, I I I read four bits in from that <laughs> that A to D board and I put together the band bits and turn it into the actual band and I track it with an ordinal. So here's how it's used. Uh, and then that multiplier is used here instead of the M uh, that I've got. I mean, that's that's what's returned. Molt is returned from this array, but it gets you assigned here as M instead of this hardwired M. I would just, I'd turn that off. So it calls this function every time it hits it. And that is, where are you? That is thinking here. Yeah. Trial and error. Here we go. So, <laughs> so we do actually six meters now on the current ribs. This hasn't been uh, updated. Uh, so but for these nine bands, I have a nine element array here. And so ordinal zero is a 38. And so, and there's four arrays because this, the scale has to be different depending on whether it's an operator standby because it's the linearity is way different when it's getting hammered with a kilowatt of power as opposed to 10 watts of drive. Can, can you mathematically describe the nonlinearity or is it just... Is it's... It there's these... Um, well... I'll and say the reason, this. The, re the reason I'll I... Say this. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go Even ahead. when as many data points as you get, the the scatter is a straight enough line that a, yeah. a two points are good enough. Um, and all we're looking at really is the top values. We want to see when he's near the top of the amplifier. We want to make sure, you know, he, he's not going over. We really want the accuracy at the top. And we don't really care if it's accurate at, you know, 100 watts or 200 watts. When we're looking at a kilowatt amplifier, we want to know when it's 800 or up exactly. And we don't want to overdrive it. So you could, you, this converges most of the time it does it actually does um and i do the old That's human amazing. throw it out if there if there's any outliers when i you know test them like you're usually like the lowest low one might be a little bit off and if it's skewing the function enough for it to to make the line skew i throw it out of the list but for now uh late recently we just get two data points and it's good enough that's uh, that's amazing um, you, you know, yeah. you can, you could, you could linearize, linearize that. I could, I could make it even, uh, uh, yeah, well, I'm still boiling it down to Y equal MX with V. So I really have only got a single curve fit line. It's a straight line approximation. If you want to go farther than that, you probably could, but you can, you can, it's you not can. worth it. In this well, case. no, it's probably not worth it. I, yeah, I, I yeah. did that with a T to the fourth, temperature to the fourth. Right. If you're doing statistics, oh yeah. If you want to do something. No, now, no, no. You take, yeah, take, you can, you can take you can an analytical take sub -region and then yeah, pass sure, it in you the to. scheme. You can we didn't it. need that. So we didn't do it. Um, no, but, you don't need that. You don't need that here. But this there, is very cool. There's, this, this there's, is so there's four calibration arrays here by band. Um, and you can see the, the nonlinear. The, think of these as multipliers. So basically, I'm taking the number and multiplying it times 38 on when it's uh, in the forward direction. But in the reverse direction on low power, the reverse coupler is more sensitive. And these are hmm. lower values too, coming back. So the the, the couplers are not linear uh, or not compare uh, correlating between sides, uh, forward and reverse. And and they are different at the low power end to the high power end. I hate to interrupt here, but we're coming up on on an hour and a half. So Warren, yep, uh, is your email available where these guys who have these detailed sure. technical questions can drill in? Yeah, as long as you're logged in on QRZ, um, my email's right here at the top. It, this one happens to go to my call sign at duck.com. Do, <laughs> do you mind if some of the guys email you? Because I'm I'm I don't mind. I'm seriously, I'm sitting here following this discussion. I've done a lot of back-end programming technical stuff. And and I've got a couple of questions that I wouldn't ask here 
but I might ask yeah. later after I got the code out yeah. and played with it a little bit. I'll, so, I may not have the right answer, but I'll give you an answer. All right, just real quick, <laughs> let's let's hear a yes or no. How many guys would like to email Warren with questions later? I will. Yeah. Well, yeah. Or four. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll answer them as I can. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll even give you code sniplets if it's something that's easier to explain. Um, I'm not a JavaScript expert. I'll tell you that. Um, uh, but you know, I did stay in a holiday Inn express last night, so I yeah. can be pretty sharp tonight. JavaScript you know is a shock. <laughs> JavaScript is a shock for anybody that has, has worked with a real language. As far as <laughs> I know that's what, that's a tongue in cheek between programmers. I know I hate it, but yeah. I like it because it gets the job done here. And, have, the other matter, question I would have about this is yeah. I, I see it generating the code behind. Have you tried integrating TypeScript with this or Angular or one of the more structured I real wonder, languages? There might be a way to plug in TypeScript. Um, I have to tell you the truth. None of my functions are complicated enough where I want to have that shortcut. Right. Uh, that tool. We use TypeScript uh, at my workplace. But here, you'll find that, you know, just like any other modular language, you want to get in and get out of these nodes really fast. Yeah. And you don't really want to make a whole program in one place, unless you have to. But basically, you're testing something, setting something, and getting out of Dodge. Right. So <laughs> the functions are so easy to write because of that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask another question here. Sure. Lynn, have you ever worked much with uh, JavaScript? Never have actually. Okay. One of your questions a few minutes ago was aiming toward the math issues, and and uh, Warren mentioned the Python libraries are available for math, and there's some JavaScript math libraries. So I'm going to make one more comment here. Simple arithmetic in JavaScript has pitfalls that you can stumble all over and never see them. It, it's it's the most bizarre mixing of strings and binaries and integers and casting yeah. back and forth. You you can you can walk into a hole and you can't even you can't even trace it. To see it. So yes, I I fell into that uh, in the um, calculation of power. Um, I think let's see you'll see stuff where I'm arbitrarily just assign the variable zero, even though I turn right around and assign it something else. Yeah. I saw that a minute ago. I saw and a that's because I'm casting it <laughs> to make sure it's a number before I put something in it. it. It'll convert a floating point to an integer and never tell you that. And you won't know you lost nine, the digits. Yeah. And another thing, and, and I noticed this in my slide deck, uh, the sample function, uh, it's very generous about command line, in line terminators. Um, if you leave off a semicolon in C, it will it complain to you to no yeah. end and won't and refuse to compile it. But JavaScript will happily run that line. So, with or sometimes that. it works and sometimes it doesn't. It's just kind of <laughs> what's the temperature? If it's above eighty degrees, it'll work. It's like it's a weird period so, of cold. Since I end up showing my code to people, I try to keep good form. <laughs> And I always try to put terminators on there. Um, there's a, let's see, late, let's see, the latest versions of Node-RED that you have an extended editor that you can turn on when you come in here and it will actually um, put a, it does a pre-compiled uh, error condition and it'll show you a red dot on the line if it can't yeah. compile it. Runs with so the length against. Very helpful, uh, yeah. All right, so uh, let's uh, let's pull the plug on this tonight, and just with the warning that I'm giving you right now, that some of these guys I know will be persistent. So if it gets to be a problem, let me know, and I'll chop them off at the knees for you. Well, can I get just get a quick one in because I know some. Oh yeah, Rob, we we knew you'd have one more question. No, 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 yeah, but this is actually for somebody else. I just noticed that you got the uh, MD80 firmware on there, and that's what my friend wanted to know if you can replace the firmware in an MD80, and apparently you can. That's a whole nother world for me, but oh yeah, I, but I, I mean yeah. you're doing your, yeah. you might have heard of my toolkit. <laughs> oh, you got yes. your own. Yes, you, I've wait, got. Wait, are a, you the guy? I am the guy. Oh, I you're the MD three eighty tools guy. I'm not the guy who started. That would be Travis Goodspeed, but uh, I was a contributor to that project. But in order to make it easy for for script kitty folks, 
I put out an, a VM virtual machine image with Linux in it that has uh, the, my toolkit, which is basically Python and Bash scripts and, you know, other, other yeah, more questions for you, maybe. commands, that's, which that's cool. build the firmware from the latest code, pulls from source, uh, the latest firmware. I patch it to add in my enhancements uh, to support large database. My, my, my um, toolkit also generates, goes out to three different sources and grabs as many of the DMR IDs and address locations as it can and builds the database. I haven't run it in a while, uh, but it has room for about 2,500, no, I mean, sorry, two, 250,000 uh, contacts. Yeah. Um, it's coming up yeah. on that. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. That's that's what the any tone, the big attraction to that. What is it, the um, what I've got it out on GitHub. Um, if you're if you have a Linux box, it's far easier. Just get my Bash script and install it. From, install the Bash script. Don't bother with the 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 Windows virtual machine. Um, but I've got instructions here of installing on right here, installing uh, on native Linux. And um, well, I haven't even updated this in six years, but. Uh, I give you the cookbook on running this bash script that installs it, gives you a quick, gives you a nice, easy to run menu <laughs> running from bash, uh, compiles the firmware. If you have an MD380, it'll, you tell it which, you know, you run it one, you, uh, well, you just run one, it gets everything. And then when you download it to the radio, you tell it which radio you're going to use. Because if you have a 390, it has to be slightly different because right. it has a GPS in it and the offset. You have a data change. dictionary for the code plugs? It has, um, I don't, it, I don't do anything with the code plugs. Um, and the code plugs are kept in, in the normal space on the radio. So it doesn't blow out the code plug. Yeah. I'm just wondering about, you know, reading, playing around with your own code. With the code the, plug. Um, now, um, okay. let's see, uh, what's his name? Uh, I'm trying to Ed Farnsworth. I can't remember if Ed is his name. Farnsworth is his last name. He helped me with some of the, the Python stuff. My 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 database is in, is compressed. So uh, no, one, if you go to straight MD three eighty tools from Travis Goodspeed, it won't fit in the radio anymore. Uh, I have token matching the compression going on, where I substitute all the states into like two digits and and the, the counties and the, the city names that are appearing a lot, and it's, it shrinks down the database file. Uh, that actually gets written to the radio. And my code that I patch when you run the compile is I, I wire in code to on the fly, decompress it. So when the call comes in on the display, it's actually displaying the correct information instead of the compressed data that's in the database that's stored on the radio. I wouldn't have thought that processor in the radio would have that much horsepower. That's surprising. <laughs> it's got a lot of power. <laughs> It really, and there's so much program space left. It's just, it's an untapped resource that nobody has the time to even play with anymore. Right, and I, I, mean, can, I can see a whole separate presentation coming up here. Yeah. There's a uh, lot of us got into it. Can into you even the buy these radios anymore? <laughs> I've got three 380s sitting over here. I never bothered to modify them because I just jumped up to the Anytone, the original oh. 868 oh. brick radio. Um, you might want to use, uh, you know, I haven't, oh, I was going to, X, run an export filter, but I think there's um, my, a transfer, transfer translator now for the database formats, but you could use my database in your radio with a simple translation. Um, but I should probably kick it out in full instead of being compressed though first, but my database is far more, eh, I hate to use inclusive, but it is. Um, I, I could see a whole nother presentation. For I don't want to do it. <laughs> I don't want to do it. It's, it's such old news. I did this I did this mostly at Hampfests and in lunch groups, lunch bunches and stuff back in the day. But you know, this is look seven years back at some of oh, my yeah. check-ins yeah. here. I've I can't believe it's been that long. I'm using uh, my three ninety. That's my main, you know, DMR radio. Yeah, it works fine with a three ninety. Mm -hmm. Um I would highly recommend you just throw this on a Raspberry Pi because you don't ever have any driver problems. The Raspberry Pi recognizes the radio instantly. Um and pull up my get my get my uh toolkit installed it'll it just and you can wire you can even wire it in in your rc local so whenever you open a shell it brings it straight into my program um and uh it will generate the firmware it will 
go generate the database and then it will it'll write it to the file, write it to the radio. You do uh, only thing you else would need externally would be a code 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 plug manager, which you've already been doing anyway to yeah. set your code plugs up. And okay. By the way, yeah, that's my repeater on oh, top of yeah. Mountain. Okay, okay, Warren, we're gonna we're gonna get you off the hook yep. now because these guys will keep you going all night. Does anybody have any other questions, Rob? <laughs> no, the answer to that is no. Okay. Uh, Warren, I, I've got I don't to want to be this... killed tomorrow at lunch. I don't want to be poisoned. So. Well, we'll, we'll kill you <laughs> after lunch. Yeah. I got to say, this is one of the best presentations. And I'm not knocking Rob, but this caught me by surprise. I saw, I looked at the website and I said, oh, yeah, it's another one of these graphical non programming tools like Centura or MasterVox. No, and what you're showing, you're showing us something that's is sophisticated. And yeah. I've been sitting here writing C sharp code just to keep my hand in while I'm looking for a job. And this may be something I just get into just to play with. This the next is, week or so. yeah, I don't want to write that at home. I mean, <laughs> it's by doing my day job. I want to well, stop it. I, I'm a, I'm a, I love programming. That's why I started out yeah. in accounting, end up in yeah. programming. So to me, it's relaxing. But at, on the other hand, this new is fun. Yeah, this, this looks like it's going to be fun. It is a lot of fun, uh, especially since the learning curve is rather quick. And I get, uh, I, I like, I call it OPC, other people's code. Right. Um, you can leverage flows from people. And, and you know what? The flows that you see on my dashboard, I, the Flex Radio one, I started with Dave W2OZ's flow. He is not a developer. And you can tell he's not a developer because <laughs> the way he write, write, writes things, uh, lots of things that'll break. It's, I had to put in air handling everywhere, uh -huh. sanity checks everywhere. And then uh, I may, and then I went around it and um, mine's a lot more efficient. Uh, and recovers from from disconnects. His does right. not. I've, so, I've made a career out of cleaning up <laughs> people that were supposed to be yes, professional yeah. programmers and wrote like high school kids. And right. I've made a pretty good living for about 20 years cleaning up that. When mess. I said I've been a developer since way back, I, I've had the same job for 31 years. I, I, I'm, I'm, I can go right now to work and open code I wrote 31 years ago. I'm still maintaining the same project. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll ask you where you work offline. <laughs> I want to be curious about it. It's a legal vertical. Right. We do desktop automation. All right. So let's pull the plug on it. Warren, right. great yep. presentation, man. This this is Appreciate a good one. It. Yep. It's amazing. And, and we you. will be we Thank will you. be in touch. Okay. I'll I'll get back to you uh, as needed. I'll, I'm out of I'm out of pocket for the next three days. Uh I'll be going out of town for a while. So I'm not, actually don't work tomorrow. So I'm I'm that's why I'm not worried about staying up late tonight. Nice. But uh, <laughs> I know I kept you guys up, but you guys were hanging on. So it, it's been uh, thank good. Thank you, Warren. Yeah, thank um, you. I'm I'm you no problem. No problem. Okay, I very good. Sending you to the wrong to the wrong Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't even think I got an email from you at all. But um, I apologize I, for that too. <laughs> I uh, and I apologize because since I guess you didn't see my email I sent three days ago, I wanted a sharper icon of the Atlanta Radio Club logo. Oh, uh, I didn't see that. I will replace that on the PDF as soon as you send me one. Okay. Uh, I the only one you have on your site is a grainy little tiny thing. Yeah. <laughs> and I dropped it on the PDF and you'll see it looks like crap. So uh send me a send me a high res one and I'll re re export the slide deck. So it doesn't All right. that. that sounds good. I'll do it. <laughs> All right. All right. Good night. Take care. Good night, Warren. Uh, Thank you. I'll see you on the net. Oh, somewhere. Warren, this is all gonna be a video. Uh I mean the 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 video of, the, of this whole thing will be in, on a couple of days on YouTube. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I'll, um, that'll be fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like I, I said, if, if you think you might be interested in doing cir circuit boards, look at my video uh, that I put out. On, go to the North Fulton uh, uh, Facebook group, uh, not Facebook group, uh, just the uh, YouTube channel for North Fulton and, and search for KiCad, K-I-K-A-D. And you will find another hour and a half presentation I did, which I don't want to do again. I'll just let you watch the video. I, be, I bet Lynn will be watching it at lunch tomorrow. He, he, is, a, he is an EE designer. Uh, so I, I've, I've gotten pretty good with that application. So right. uh, as you can see, all that stuff you saw on my website page is there on QRZ. I've, I've created, you know, I ship it out to China, unfortunately, but they're cheaper. Right. All right, guys. Take care, guys. Good night. Thanks again.
See you now. Good night, everyone. Thanks. We'll, we'll, we'll have it again. Y'all remember Sunday at the airport, the coax and connectors. If you've got a coax you need ends on or SO239s or power poles, come on out. We'll we'll cobble something on there. And not only will we do it, you'll, you'll learn how to do it yourself. That's you want to see how to put a power pole on my coax. <laughs> Well, you have to use one of the big ones. I'll actually bring one that's made for coax if you want to see it. I got it from Charles Golson years ago, and I think he stole it off a military truck or something. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a weird-looking thing. All right. Good night, guys. Bye.